guys, we'll get started now. For those who don't know me, my name is Nick Zimmer. I'm the owner of The Plantsman. I am a fairly new beneficial insect supplier here in Michigan. Um, came into the game about maybe eight months ago. I'm a grower with uh, a lot of knowledge with using bugs in my own garden and decided to start my own company kind of advising cannabis growers on the best practices, the best bugs, trying to make it easy for you guys. Take something that kind of is boring and complicated and turn it into something that's tangible and easy to work with. So that's why I'm here. Uh, this is meant to be a very loose, casual, conversation oriented class. So I would love lots of questions. Raise your hand, stop me whenever I say something you don't understand. I'll try to keep it as simple and basic as possible. Um, but I am the bug guy and I'm here to tell you about bugs, what to use, how to use them, when to use them, what to do, all that good stuff. Um, so that's our that's that's my portion of this. And Dylan's here to, to you know, we're, we work together. He uses a lot of my bugs. Um, he's got a great program going using beneficials preventatively, which I hope you guys can kind of lean on his experience because he has a great system. Um, and it's working awesome. I've watched it and uh, so hopefully you guys can can learn a lot from us and Just stop me if you got any questions. Yeah, I just want to say real quick before we get started too. I obviously thank you guys for all coming yeah. um, you know, we You know, we're, we're we decided to do this together. I work with Nick a lot like you said on the side uh, We're in a lot of facilities together small and large scale caregiver to you know multi-million dollar, you know big facilities uh, integrated pest management is a something that like I'm very passionate about it. Um, you know, I, I worked in the food industry for a while where that's all I did as well. Different insects, but the same rules apply um, that, that were a threat. Um, and, and I, from, from my experience, you know, out in, in, in facilities and working, networking with a lot of growers, um, you know, there's, there's, there's integrated pest management is something that I still don't feel that is, is quite understood in the cannabis industry. You know, we're going to talk a lot of today about prevention. This is not about putting out forest fires, right? Mm -hmm. It's the last thing we want to be doing is constantly being, you know, being the guy that's chasing some fire, whether it's powder mildew outbreaks or rusted outbreaks, or, you know, it's about how, how do we mitigate and prevent all this from happening? And, and um, you know, and it's, it's very, very important to, you know, a successful garden, especially if you're at any kind of scale at all. And scale could mean 20 lights, right? It doesn't mean 2,000 yeah. lights. And, 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 that's um, a great point. And yeah, we don't size doesn't matter and like the same rules apply to large and small and the same with the bugs like it doesn't they don't discriminate, I, they don't discriminate and I don't <laughs> I want to coach any size grower it yeah. really doesn't matter to me how big you are so um, great point yeah yeah and we're, we're uh, we tag team out in the in the, in the um, industry here in Michigan a lot we work together a lot yeah I wanted to have to do a class with Nick I was at Nick's place just the other day he has an amazing greenhouse of regular ornamentals and annuals and perennials and, and um, has a great program in place very smart individual and um, you know I, I thought that this would, would bring a nice mesh to you know I'm, I'm more cannabis specific he's much more diverse when it comes to IPM and what the bugs do you know what what you may specifically need right and we we work well bouncing a lot of stuff together so we put together um, you know a presentation for you guys but we also want to keep it loose like you said if you guys have any topics we already wrote some stuff up there that's outside of our agenda for today please feel free to either shout them out now we'll put them up there or if something comes up feel free to, to put it out there so we can try to you know talk through it right so yeah and like Dylan said I, I come from the ornamental industry so I am a, my I got a degree in horticulture I was a grower for five years at a huge, you know, ornamental 80,000 square foot place. I now own my own garden center greenhouse where we grow and sell every plant under the sun. I also grow cannabis. I love cannabis. Um, but I've been using these bugs at my facility for, for years and I market myself as a pesticide free garden center, which is my little niche. And, you know, I would hope in the future that you guys can start leaning on that too, as a way to market yourself and separate from the pack in a market that's tight and tricky. Like it could be a way for you guys to, you know, say, listen, I'm not spraying and, and tell the customer, the consumer that, and uh, you know, you might be able to get a little more money, which is what I do in my business. You know, I charge a premium because I'm not spraying and it costs me more money to do it that way. But there's so many profound, you know, goodness that comes from it. You know, not having to worry about pests like I normally do or putting out fires constantly. And, you know, having my little kids be able to run around and not worry about when I sprayed last or what the REI was or you know all these little things that just add up so um cool you can go to the next time all right all right so um you know we i started this company because of 
what I felt was a gap in the industry. I used to work with Copert, which is another big, you know, insect supplier and was just not getting the service that I needed and the coaching that I needed. And so um, I branched out and started my own thing. So that's why we're here we're really focused on customer service, focused on working directly with you guys, big and small, helping you come up with a program that's suited for you um, and just make the whole process easy and digestible for you. You can hit the next slide. So the main problem that you know everyone's facing is Number one, there's, there's only so many options we can use in Canvas, whether you're le legal or not. I mean, no one wants to spray Eagle or Avid in flower. I mean, that's, that's a no-brainer. So the products that we have are kind of ineffective. <laughs> you know, they, they work to some degree, but you can't use them past week four. So you're really stuck in this um, tricky spot where, you know, you get later in the flower, you only have so many options you can do. So the benefit that we've come up with is you utilize these bugs early on, you never have that problem. It's all prevention. So the, the solution to our problem is preventative applications. So um, Dylan touched on it, but you know, what is IPM? You know, it's integrated pest management. I mean, in a nutshell, it's it's a big picture look at the whole thing. It's 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 thinking about all the problems that are gonna come your way and thinking about how you can stay ahead of those problems. So you're you're looking at it from a very holistic large picture perspective and you're you're thinking about specific ways you can eliminate problems from ever entering your garden strict sanitation protocols you know mitigating your clothes when you're coming in and out um, not bringing in genetics or if you do bring in genetics you have a, a quarantine protocol you know simple stuff like that that you work into your program that sets you up for success um, but you really got to be thinking ahead and thinking about all the problems that are going to come your way because they're going to happen like whether it's happened yet or not, it's going to happen. And yes. You, we have any organic growers in here today? All right, so organic growers, shout out. Yep. Uh, the hardest type of growing is organic growing, okay? 100%. Salt growing is a, a breeze compared to it. Organics, you're always three to four weeks out with decisions you're making, right? You're thinking ahead. How is what I'm gonna put into the soil affect three to four weeks down the road, right? Pest management, IPM is the same way. Yep. You gotta think. You gotta think the same. You gotta be you gotta be thinking way ahead what yeah. season am i in you know what season are we approaching you know um what week of flower what's coming up you know um what what pressures do i normally see and you gotta you gotta be thinking ahead just like you are when you're growing organically so and, and then complacency is where you, most people run into problems you get comfortable you get situated you go on autopilot and the shit you know you forget that we're all human and bugs find their way in or pm finds his way in and so that's the number one rule is like don't get complacent, don't get comfortable, always assume that something bad can happen because it probably will eventually, but you know, putting these simple tools in place ahead of time will really reduce the fires. And I mean, watching his garden and you know, some thrips pop up, but like we've already got the tools in place, so we just adjust them a little bit. It's not something that we're putting on a fire, we're just making small adjustments. And that's the kind of moves that you wanna be making is these small adjustments versus these big, like, oh shit moments. Okay, moving on. So um, we're gonna just touch on some of the different pests now. Um, so these are pests that you're generally gonna see up in the leaves of your plants. Um, most of the time we're seeing aphids and thrips and spider mites. Occasionally we'll see white flies, that's that one on the far right. I don't really see it in cannabis as often. Um, but knowing your pest is the number one thing to figuring out what to treat for. Um, you know, we're going to talk about curative and preventative and like, you know, what to use in each place. Um, but if you're in a curative fashion where you're treating a problem, step one, identify the pest. Um, so then we'll break into the soil dwelling pests. You're going to have part of a thrip's life is lived in the soil. So we've got their larva or pupa stage. Um, outdoor growers, you're going to have some beetles in there that can be present. We've got fungus in that larva. We've got root aphids. Those are your main problems that we're going to see. Um, you can go ahead. You know, in cannabis, what I hear every day is, is the four you see up there, aphids, thrips, fungus gnats, and spider mites. You know, we'll get some russets pop up, we'll get some root aphids pop up, but those four are like what I see the most often. And what I generally, when I'm creating a preventative plan for someone, those are the ones I'm thinking of mainly. And then if somebody comes in and like, I got russets, then we'll do a fine tune adjustment and throw in some androsomy or some other bug that's specific. Go ahead. 
Um, so spider mites, you know, I break into some details on this, but you know, you're gonna see those up in the undersides of the leaves. Generally, you're gonna see some spotting, little white spots all over the top of the leaves. Um, in a bad situation, you're gonna get all the way to webbing, which is, you know, that's, that's when you get pretty far into the situation. Um, they, at, at youth, they'll be clear. When they get to the adult stage, you'll see these two little black spots on them. And that's a, a clear way to kind of identify those versus like a predator if you have predators in your room. Um, Who has a scope? Yes, great. If you don't have a scope, you're missing your biggest tool. Yeah, definitely have a scope. I mean, get a good scope too. It's like, I don't know, I brought, you know, the one I, I use at, the, at my place, which is a little more heavy duty. Um, but I think it was still like 80 or 100 bucks. You guys got scopes here? You got scopes here? Those like LCD screen scopes? Um, we can get them. 65 bucks, look to yourself. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's yeah. such an important tool. And uh, great point, I would definitely have that. And just, you know, that? What's that? What brand is that? I don't know, I got that one off Amazon. Amazon's got a ton of them on there too. I'll, uh, I'll, we can look at the, the model number after, but there's a bunch of different varieties. I mean, just get one that's got a good zoom in. Um, and, you know, I'm always checking samples. It's my favorite thing to do. I actually just think it's fun to look at, you know, zoom in on weird stuff and find bugs. And so it's also very good to use, like, <clears throat> whenever I get my bugs in that I order, I always check the motility. It's the first thing, you know, yeah. when, I, when I pop that box open, like, I'm going to take a sachet out of the Swirsties or whatever I ordered. I'm, like, I'm going to take a little bit of the nematodes out. I'm going to mix them up, and I'm going to put them under the scope to make sure that they're viable, yeah. right? There's motility there because... Um, you know, no one's perfect, and these our live insects are shipped from where? Israel? They start their life in Israel, these bugs yeah. right here. How so. do you scope the nematodes? Uh, you put them in water, right? You yeah, should get yeah. the glass slides. Remember back in the day, like science oh, okay. class? Yeah, you got to squish them between the... You, we did it. The, you can do it with a spoon it was and, and eventually it see them, hard. but they should look like... It's crazy. When you finally get nematodes under a scope, right? If they're active, they're, oh, like, they're terrifying to see. They're like... I'll put that in my soil. Yeah, just I'm attacking how, how to know if the nematodes are good. I mean, that's one bug that you should feel good that will likely come in fine because they're like they want to be refrigerated, yep. and so they'll make sure they package them. At least for my company, they'll package them separately, yeah. put them in a, with an ice box. You know, yeah, when I bring them home, I keep them in the fridge. Yeah, so yeah, and we'll talk about like best practices for storage and stuff okay. Um, okay. a little bit later. You can you can go to the next slide. Um, fungus gnats. Who here has some fungus gnats that they want to treat? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah, right. Who doesn't? They're they're everywhere. I mean, if you're growing in cocoa, or really any media, um, it's very common. Rarely do they really like take you out of the game, but they're just a pest and they hate them. And, um, but they're really easy to treat for. So, um, you know, a little bit of prevention goes a long way with with fungus gnats. Um, and we'll we're gonna break into each bug and what I recommend for it um, a little bit later after we kind of go through each each one. While we were at fungus nest, let's just talk for a second about sticky traps, because this is a good segue. Yeah. Um, sticky traps are great. I love them. I don't use them to trap. I use them to monitor, and that's really what their function is. Um, you know, in a, on a bench, on a four bay bench, you should have one. You know what I mean? To to check what's going on on that bench. Um, the guy, you know, and I, it's not like a bad thing, but if you're going to spend the money to put a sticky trap per pot, yeah. then spend the money on some bugs and treat the problem instead of putting a band-aid on it, you know? So, um, probably the number one thing I see when I go into facilities is that people still think that sticky traps are some sort of like mouse yeah. traps. Or yeah. It's like, it's like I, I went to a facility the other day, a thousand plants per room and they had two on every plant. Oh, so the labor, labor to, labor to put those out, right? With the twist ties, finding the branch to hang them. And, 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 and at that point it's like, I told him, I said, guys, we're, we know we have a problem. We look at what's going on. Let's treat the problem. You know, um, but it, it's just a misconception, right? Like, yeah. hey, we think people treat them like a mouse trap because there's not a lot of education on that. And to what he said, they're a monitoring device. Yeah. So and, and, and to that scope por portion, you should be taking your, your sticky traps. You know, sometimes, for instance, a real quick differentiation between fungus gnats and root aphid flyers are very similar. Mm -hmm. A lot of times people will think they have fungus gnats and really I'm like, dude, you got root aphids. Yeah. And yeah. then we'll go check the root zone and sure enough, right? So using that scope, using the monitoring traps to identify what do you have in your room? Yep. Right? So 100%. And I mean, for me, like at my place, I put new traps out every two weeks and every week or every couple days, I will check those traps and see what's changed. And I'll have a log and be like, all right, so last week I had I had two fungus gnats in one square. This week I got six. 
So that tells me that my population is growing and I, my treatment isn't really working. So that's the kind of mindset you should have when it comes to sticky traps is they're a great, great way to see if things are working or not working. Um, but if you're using them as a trap, you're missing, you know, they just go lay their eggs in the soil and the larvae just live in the soil. So when you're trapping the adults, you're doing nothing, yeah. you know? Um, so treat the soil and you will fix the problem. Um, cool. <clears throat> Thrips, probably the number one pest that, you know, I get calls on and you know, it's, it's a pain in the butt, but it's manageable. Um, you know, you can, you can grow fire with a few thrips living around you and you can manage them very effectively with, with beneficials, but you need to be starting early and you need to have a plan. And, you know, thrips live mostly up in the foliage. So they're going to be up in the bottom of the leaves. You're going to see these little kind of grayish silver spots. That is where they've kind of sucked the juices out of the leaves. And then you see these little black specks on those spots that would be where they pooped. So that's your kind of telltale sign that you've got some thrips running around. And if you have that damage, you're to a far enough point that you really need to do some treatment. Um, if you have a couple just running around with no visible damage, I would throw some bugs at it. If I've got visible damage, I'm gonna start with a spray and follow up with some bugs. Yeah. Um, so you, you, you know, each situation will be kind of hard to differentiate, but if you've got damage in adults, you're gonna to wanna to spray and then follow up with the bug. What kind of spray do you like? Um, Azagard's a good one. Um, Spinosad is a good one. It depends if you're in, you know, if you're a legal market, then don't use Spinosad or at least use it really early in veg and then stop. But I mean, it's not, it's not a licensed product, so, or a, you know, legal product to use. But it, Spinosad is very thrip specific. And in my industry, we stopped using Spinosad because the thrips gained immunity. So it worked super good for, for years, for the last 20 years. And then all of a sudden, you know, every generation they were using it, a few would get through and those would multiply. So they bred these like super thrips yeah, yeah. that are immune to spinosad. So we stopped using it in ornamental. And uh, I honestly have way better luck with beneficials than I ever had with Avid and spinosad in ornamentals. You know, I don't know why I have great control using the beneficials with thrips. Yeah, but that, that's before you get them, though, for the most part. Yeah, right? I mean, for me, I'm I'm an open greenhouse, so I'm always bringing in bugs. Like, yeah. it's no, there's no way around it, you mm -hmm. know? And um, so I expect them. And in years before, when I was just conventionally spraying, it was just putting out fires constantly. That's, that's, I, just, I just started dealing with them a couple months ago. They're only in one room, mm -hmm. and there's only three plants in that room. Okay. So I'm just wondering if I should take cuts off the plants. You know, are they in veg? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Veg. I mean, uh, spinal sad's a, a you know a safe product to spray. Another thing that works good in veg. A lot of greenhouse growers know this tech. Your own greenhouses, but isopropyl alcohol uh, is oh, okay. will dry them right out. Adults, oh, okay. um, but I think and he's probably going to segue in this. We got to treat the soil too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's and so, yeah. so a lot of times I'll spray. But I'm only foliar spraying the plants, so I'm killing what's up top, but I'm not kill, but I'm not well, there's a the nematode fixing the, the yeah, problem. Yeah, yeah I'm doing the nematodes too. Nematodes how will often, help. How often yeah. should I use nematodes? Nematodes are usually a weekly application unless you have a situation that you're treating and it can go twice. You can do it as often as you want to. Okay. Um, but general practice should be weekly on the nematode drench or spray. Okay. Um, and again, it's just kind of like if you're feeling heavy pressure, then go up, go up on that. If yeah. you're not, you can even back to every two weeks. You know, it's not not critical. All right, go ahead. Um, yeah, but uh, thrips do live part of their life in the soil. So if we're treating thrips, we're treating the foliage and we're treating the soil. And we'll go into what I recommend for those. Aphids. I hate aphids. Uh, I'm dealing with them right now in my greenhouse. It's going to be a really bad year for aphids. I want you guys to be aware. Leaf, leaf aphids. Leaf aphids. Just because it was such a mild winter. And, you know, that really deep cold will do a really hard kill on a lot of this stuff. Um, so I'm... I always fight aphids and I'm fighting them earlier than normal and I'm just preparing everyone for, you know, especially outdoor growers, mm -hmm. it'll likely be a tricky, just, you know, you want to be ahead of it. Um, you know, they are a nuisance. They're not going to be as, I don't know, damaging for yield, but like you're going to get them all up in the butt. So really it's, they're just in there sucking the juices out. They don't need to lay eggs. They reproduce asexually. So they just pop out live babies all day long, uh, which makes them, you know, take over. Quick. Fast. Quick. Um, I don't know if you guys follow me on Instagram, but I did go to a facility that was just loaded with aphids. And 
I've actually had really good luck with the treatment plan we put together. Now it took some time and some money, but uh, you know, they do work. And he's got a side-by-side -side spray greenhouse and bug greenhouse. And he said it's working better. So that was really cool to see. And I was actually kind of surprised because like, it was bad. <laughs> it was really bad. All right, go ahead. So indoor like versus outdoor. The, in, like, in a situation like that, do you, rec do you recommend them to like wash down the plants, try to get that army? So what we did was we started on a super young crop and like I didn't think I was going to be able to get any any traction in any of those older houses. Right. Yeah. So we started on a brand new room and went aggressive and every two weeks he was loading. Um, no, I mean, I told him to, yes, I told him to spray three times before the bug showed up. So we did like a, a sulfur, Azagard sulfur, mm -hmm. and then he washed them down just to rinse off and then they released and then he stopped, you know, spraying. Right. So, um, yeah, I mean, you definitely want to, if you have a pest population, trying to knock back your population before applying bugs is a great tool to get your good bugs ahead of the game. Like, that was like you know, obviously now, you know, I yeah, approach things differently, but back in the day, you know, I would always see better results with like, you know, obviously deleafing the shit out of the plant. Yep. Trying trying to get as much army, you know, in a trash bag out of there. Exactly. You know, trying to get as much of that army out of there so you're fighting less. Physical removal is the first one of the first things you should do before the spray. So if you haven't done a pluck or if you haven't done a thin out, do that first. Physically Every, remove. I, I always, you know, went for the leaves that show damage. For sure. You know, yep. Is. Absolutely. Get them out of there. It's easy and it's cheap. Right, right, right. So uh, that's a great point. Yep. That would be step one to a nice infestation is physically remove as much of the population as you can. Step two would be let's spray the crap out of it and not just spray once, but spray two or three times with a two to three day interval. Um, so that would be step two. And then step three would be release. Um, so it's usually a good plan because typically when you order, when you order beneficial bugs, it's going to take seven days to come in anyways. Yep. So typically if I'm ever dealing with an issue, um, that's above prevention, you know, I'll, I'll contact Nick. I'll say, Hey, I need ABCD and I know it's going to be seven days. So I'll do the stripping or the spring or if I can, right. If, if we're not deep in the flower, um, and I'll do all that preventative stuff. That way, when those bugs land, I've already done the pre-treatment. I've got as much, I've knocked down as much as I can, and I'm gonna send the army in. You know. Yep. Perfect. Um, so this would we can just touch on like indoor versus outdoor and kind of things to expect. But I mean, it's two totally different games. Um, obviously, indoor is much more controllable. You're gonna be able to really manage the pests a lot easier. Um, but you know it comes with its own hurdles because outdoor you got the whole natural enemies out there so they're already working so as long as you don't spray everything all the time they're going to be out there working and it can help you so yeah. it's it's a catch-22 but you know indoors generally you're going to find less pressure you're going to be able to manage things easier um you know it's, it's easier to dial things in is there uh, a too early to start is it too early to start no, i'm saying is there a too early to start not necessarily so like uh take for instance like a big huge outdoor farm mm -hmm. just transplant start right now yeah oh yeah and i mean there's a, a lot of people that are in that boat i mean outdoor i'm in the mindset of smaller plants are better mm -hmm. um, yeah. or easier to manage mm -hmm. so Absolutely. like don't start too early start right, late right, 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 right. <laughs> otherwise it'll be 10 feet tall and you'll be like what have i what have i done <laughs> um so it's hard to get eyes on things that are you know obviously you can get the ladders out and do all that but in michigan yeah you know specifically we're not california we don't have low humidity our season is crazy outside especially if you're going outside or in greenhouses it's been proven over time like i don't even plant when i used to do outdoor until like man like mid-july yeah, yeah. I don't know. Know. yeah. It, it just the big plants just you're going to lose all, my experience and everybody's maybe different i lose half that plant whether it's the bugs or yeah. i don't get up on a ladder every single day try this or 72 or plants and climb up to the top and see what's going on yeah. i want you at eye level or below yeah 100 percent. i mean that's my mindset too and, and it i'd rather plant a few more plants and have them be small and manageable than have you know five absolute mammoths yeah. so um for outdoor you know i didn't put a slide in here but there are it's used in ag a lot but there are plants that you can plant in your area that will attract beneficial bugs um so like plants like alyssum or ornamental peppers or marigolds are all things that benefit there's like just 
a lot of these bugs will be attracted to because they can also eat some pollen. Um, so like big farms, big strawberry farms, big cucumber farms, they'll have alyssum planted every 20 feet or they'll have a whole row of it that will bring in these surfid flies and these other bugs that will be looking for aphids. So um, if you have an outdoor farm, you should look into just planting sporadically some of these good plants. But you can plant peppers. Yep, ornamental peppers, alyssum, and, and marigolds are your top three to bring in beneficial insects. And really, you just scatter them around on your corners and stuff. Yes, sir? I, just to add, I've heard it's good to have like sacrificial plants too. Like, Sacri it, it, like, like a, is that not, I mean. It is, it's like a, I forget, yes. I know, like yeah. kale? It, it, it like, like draws like the bugs draws to the that. Bugs, yeah. 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 There's another word, I forget it, but yes. I, I haven't really done that and it's, <laughs> to me it's a, it's another one that I go back and forth with because you're like, like you're attracting them, yeah. but they're drawn to that one plant, so. That's one I, I don't what know. What if some aren't attracted to that one plant? <laughs> exactly. I mean, you obviously wouldn't put it right in the middle right. of the garden, but you'd put them, you know, you draw them away. So I think there's validity to it. I just kind of go back and forth on my own mind, logically. That makes sense. Because you're... Cause I, I use like beetle lures and stuff like that, that will, it's like a bag to get Japanese beetles, for instance, um, which I fight in the garden center all the time. So I put these bags out, you know, 200 feet from my garden center, it has a lure on it, it's a pheromone trap, so they like think there's a lady over there and they go get stuck in the bag. But my, you know, I think I might be bringing more in than we're naturally there, so I don't know. That's a good question that I don't have a specific answer for you, but. Uh, let's see, so, you know, I work with a lot of growers and what I do is I set them up with what I call action plans. And this, what's on there right now is just an example of an action plan. And really what it is is like a feeding chart for bugs. And uh, it would be like, you know, you've got your weeks on the top in green for veg, you've got your weeks uh, in red for flower. So you just follow the chart, use this bug at this time, and you should have very few problems. This is just one example for one grower I just wanted to show you. I can happily set you guys up if you ever want help figuring out what to use and when to use it. I will do this for anybody. Um, but the essence of these plans is this. You want to start early. You want to reapply every two to three weeks and you want to try to get three treatments on a crop throughout its life. And doing those few steps can really set you up for success. Um, so like week two of veg, treat. Week five of veg, treat. Week two of flower, treat, or something like that. Depending on what your cycle is and how long you veg would determine when you would want to treat. Um, but that is, that is the essence. Three treatments throughout a crop's life start as early as you can in veg um, and usually stop early to mid flower. And if you do that, that's like that should be the last time you treat. <clears throat> prevention. Prevention. Prevention and, and also, you know, <clears throat> identifying, you know, do anybody here know what, what like threshold levels are, right? It's back to what he said earlier about identifying like what's on a sticky trap. I have threshold levels for, for my for my veg and my flower. Threshold levels are identifying what's acceptable and if I go mm -hmm. above this, if that's I'm above that threshold level, I have to take action and what is that action? And that's all predetermined for me. I know and he knows, you know, when I say, hey, I need an extra box of this, I just went above a threshold, he knows I went above a threshold level. Now I have to take action, right? Um, and so identifying what your threshold levels are, what your pests are, what are you seeing in your garden, and, and then having a plan and sticking to it. Um, if you guys, depending on the size of your garden or, or kind of what your rotation is between veg and flower, I recommend trying to get on a, you know, for me, I'm on a cycle where my bugs just come. Right, I just I put together a plan. I know when I need them, which is every two weeks, and they just come the same amount. Now sometimes I'll have to say, hey, throw an extra box of this in, or hey, I don't need that this week. Yep. But for the most most time, it's the same things because if I don't do that because I'm distracted and I have 900 other things going on, like most of us do, right? Mm -hmm. I will forget to order, and now I get off track, which is my habit that I did for years. And that's when all of a sudden now I let my guard down. And, and if, if I skip, if I, if I do that too many times, my threshold levels are going to go way up, possible infestation is going to come in, right? So, yep, absolutely. Yeah, and that's, I mean, it's a good point. You just want to be ahead of it. And if you get on the autopilot setup, it just gets worked into your production plan and you don't have to think about it. And it's the same way, like he's talking about for my garden center, at X date after transplant, we do that. And Three weeks after that, we do that, you know, and so it's kind of a predetermined plan. Um, what do you like three grand worth of bugs? Oh my God, I got so much, it's stupid. We like I spent $3,000 so worth of beneficial bugs in those greenhouses, yeah. it's insane. And like the fact that I can 
you know, a lot, I hear people are like, man, bugs are expensive, and they are. And like, you gotta put a value to your time in spraying, and you know, the fact that you're spraying, and uh, it's it's got so much more value to it than just like the cost. And you know, a lot of growers don't value their time like they should. And so how many, you know, if you're spraying twice a week for two hours, you know, what does that equal? What is that, you know, in money? And well, it should have quite a bit of value. Well, like that big farm aspect, you said bringing in those plants that can attract the beneficial, that's probably a good cost effective way. It is, I mean, it's, it's a piece to the puzzle. You know what I mean? It's not, the, the beneficials that I sell are naturally occurring bugs that are in nature that we won't see in Ohio or Michigan until mid-June. So by inoculating early, we're just setting the, the table for the good guys to get ahead. And it's really like this tipping point. So like when do the pests get ahead of the predators? You know, that's the tipping point that's in favor of the pest. But the goal is if we can always keep it in favor of the predator, then they never have a chance. So even when they show up, they're like, oh shit, there's a bunch of swirsky that are about to eat me, so. You know, in, in an indoor setting, you kind of like remove everything after the run, you know, reset. Reset. On the outdoor setting. On the outdoor the setting, it's more of an ecosystem, or? you know, where you're, you're, you keep inoculating. And so for me, like, I am the outdoor grower. So I've been, I started in February, you know, and slowly, and, and it goes like this for me, mm -hmm. as the pest pressure goes like this for me. Right, right. So, um, I'm always trying to stay ahead of it. I mean, right now, like I said, I'm, I'm like battling aphids like it's my job and I don't feel like I'm winning, but I can see them working and I'm, I'm on that threshold line where like, I gotta make a call in the next week whether I decide that I say, screw it, I'm gonna have to blast these baskets because the aphids are winning or I gotta, you know, I just gotta make a decision. So I have one more huge order of bugs coming next week that I'm gonna try to just lace them up. Um, but. You know, I, even the bug guy fights bugs hard every year, <laughs> every year, yeah. which is fun. I mean, it's a fun kind of game as long as you don't lose terribly because um, I'm always learning and I always think I've got it kind of figured out and then I realize I don't. And that's what I love about gardening and plants and the whole thing. Like it's a, it's a never ending learning process, which is makes it fun. Um, so the most <laughs> frequent beneficials I use Swirsky is probably my most popular product. Swirsky is a predatory mite that I sell in a sachet or in a little tube. Um, sachet is just a fancy word for a pouch. And uh, I don't know why or who came up with that, it's dumb. Um, but the sachets have little holes in them so you don't have to do anything. You hang this thing right up in your canopy. You wanna put it up in the foliage of your plant. So if you're gonna do a strip, do it above the strip. Um, I generally use these sachets in flower and I'll use the loose um, in veg as I really don't feel like I need to put a hole or allocate a whole sachet to a small veg plant. It seems like a lot of mite for a small plant. So what I'll do is I'll get a tube and do a little sprinkle on my veg plants early on and then when I move into flowers, when I start hanging the sachets. Um, so Swirsky is one of my most popular products. It fights thrips, it fights spider mites. Those are its main two food sources. Well, Russets as well, it'll, it'll feed on russets. Um, I use that Swirsky the most because of its generalist habit, so it'll eat multiple things. Whereas some of the other bugs, like Persimilis, which also comes in a sachet, is spider mite specific. So this will only eat mites. So if I have spider mites, this is my the first thing I go to. Because I know that it will focus its energy just on that and you know, if I'm running a preventative, I would start with Swirsky because it will it will feed on mites, but it'll also feed on thrips. Good job. Um, let's see. So I've also got. I'm gonna just go through. I've got my list up there, but I'll just tell you guys about the bugs I've got up here because these are really my bread and butter bugs. Yes, sir. Uh, what other predators do you use for like uh, flying predators? I'm, just, I'm assuming you also use predators in combination. Yeah. Oh yeah. And um, it depends on the who I'm fighting. Uh, Roommate is that of, like grown wings. Root aphids, so root, my recipe of root aphids is, is Delosia, which is the rogue beetle, um, which I've got right here. Um, I also use the Stradiolalaps or Hypoaspis. It's two names for the same thing. This is a soil mite. Um, and then you also use the nematodes. <laughs> Along with, the root aphids are a pain in the butt. Now, you want to go really high rates on the rogue beetles. I also use BioSears. I, I get it as a Botanigard, but it's the same thing. Um, you would do this as a drench, 
I think it's like maybe two ounces per gallon or something like that is your highest rate to use. Um, root aphids, you generally want to hit them from all different layers. So you do the, the two main soil predators, you do the nematodes and the biosears, and those all together will help you get rid of them. And root aphids indoors too, guys. There's there's a they are a triple threat. So they're going to be uh, they're going to be in a larva stage. They're going to be in, in in what is it the, the larva, and then there's the crawling adults, and then there's the flying adults, mm -hmm. right? So you know I've mm -hmm. it's it's you got to be mindful of the flyers, and that's where we're going to want to be identifying having sticky traps. So you can identify whereas as we're doing these treatments, let's say you get all these bugs, you start applying, you want to you want to reset those sticky traps probably every few days because we want to we want to watch where's our population with the aphids going are we going down or is it not working right i see a lot of people that spend a lot of money on bugs because they'll, they'll, they'll hit me up they'll inbox me i'll tell them what they need and then they'll just they'll throw it at it and then they think that that's just gonna that's that's it and, and that, that is that's a good start but we got to monitor now it's never a one and done what, what's going on right so watch because we, we, you would want to some sticky traps to identify those flyers right yep. and see where that level is um with the flyers because that's the end life stage and if then, we don't get rid of those flyers they're just going to get back on the plant and repopulate the soil yeah it's just a they're, they're nasty they're the worst thing in my opinion to have well they're just hard to get to eradication and like that that's a hard word to get to <laughs> in in anything like unless you're spraying or you're bombing you know it's a threshold and it's it's a, a tolerance that you can deal with i mean having a couple thrips is not the end of the world and uh you know the idea is you get to a point where you basically don't see them you're never seeing damage you know everyone's sort of like oh there's one but it's, you know whatever my bugs are working um and sometimes i think it's important to talk about too when we're, when we're dealing with this if you're in flower you have something like root aphids i've had root aphids plenty of times plenty of times and i've held them at bay root aphids are also another pest where if you can keep them at if you can keep them to an acceptable level, they won't have crazy effects on your plants, mm -hmm. right? I mean, they will stress them out, and if it gets real bad, they will definitely destroy the root zone, right, of, of your plant. Um, but if you can keep them at an acceptable level, which I've had to limp along runs to for, for the last four weeks, I've identified them at, you know, day 28 of flower, and there's only so much I can do, and I've kept them at an acceptable level where they're around, right? But I've never seen them get crazy, and I've limped through a run. And then we'll talk about this later, but... If I go through something like that, now what's my reset procedure when, when, when we're done with that harvest mm -hmm. and we limp through? Yeah. Um, sometimes, the, I mean, I'm battling thrips in a room right now and flower, day, day 45. They're just around. They're not tearing my plants up. Garden looks great, but they're around. Oh, they're, and I'm yeah. using Swirsky's and I'm applying every week, right? And they're keeping them at bay and I'm fine with it. You know, I'm, I'm good with it. Um, you know, my, my, my bread and butter for me is my veg. That's where I have to be like 150 percent on my shit right because that is that is where if i get a problem in there now yeah. flower rooms you get that you get that break right we're going to get to the end of the crop we're going to reset clean filters go through that whole procedure to eliminate what else could be in the room and you can bring in a fresh batch and restart you get that into your veg it's a whole nother yeah. world of shit too, right? what's that also mom room, mom yeah. room bedroom yeah. yeah 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 that's it's 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 tough when we get them on on something like that. I mean, if I get root aphids on like a mom, you know, I'm going to cut as many clones as I can before that plant gets too stressed out. This is just me. I'm going to cut a bunch of clones. I'm going to go through a dunk procedure to kind of make sure I don't have anything crawling on there, re-clone everything, and probably get that mom right out of there. I'm not going to waste my time trying to treat that mom. What are you going to dunk everything? We'll, we, we'll go over that in a little bit. We'll, okay. we'll, mostly sulfur is what I'm going to dunk in, yeah. you know, for, for, for um, pest prevention, mildew prevention. Especially when getting a new genetics, and we'll go over that in a little bit. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. What is consider? No, sulfur doesn't deal with uh, thrips, though, right? It, 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 it will a, knock them. It's an insecticide. It's, it, yeah, it, it, think it, of it like a, an insecticide. Yeah, it will help. It's not going to be my go-to, um, but it definitely helps, and I think it's the best broad-spectrum thing for mites and mildew for sure. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's yeah. a it's a good way to start clean especially sure. for the price yeah exactly 75 yeah. bucks for like a 250 yeah. pound bag or whatever yeah. all right let me uh great question and to to follow up on your your question like you know you'll see the best efficacy on stuff that you can in your veg where you can start early like you know if you can start inoculating your plants now that are young you'll in flower you won't have any problems but plants that are in flower right now you won't have as much time to build up that population and the investment might not always be, you know, worth it. It just last night I got a call on guys like 
when you're in week four or five in flower, it is a tough call which direction to go. And like, I don't want you wasting your money. I know what the market's like. like I know everything. So, you know, it's a tough decision. Do if, if you order for me today, you're not going to get bugs for a week. Like, is it worth it? And are you going to see that on the other end? Probably not. Like you're still going to get through your, your harvest. And, um, so that's it's something that I fight with every, every day almost with that phone call. Um, and I kind of have to leave it up to the, the choice of the grower. Like, yes, my bugs will help, but they're not going to solve it. There's, you're still going to see some when you go to harvest. Um, it's definitely going to keep it from, you have to do something. So a week four or five is the crucial. It's that moment. Man, you get like mildew or something pops up week four or five, buddy, you are in a tough yeah. call. Right. Well, and that's where we go back to the, to the, to the prevention and to having a plan. And you know, you don't run into those situations if you were running a preventative program. Like you, it doesn't happen because you've already you've already planned for it, and you've already made moves to make sure that it doesn't happen. So, you know, think about that. It's I, I would love. Yeah, go ahead, sir. Uh, are you also adding like a bacillus or trichoderma? I'm assuming it's probably. So the bacillus is the biosphere. Um, this is a bacillus, uh, or is this Bavaria? I'm assuming. Uh, I think it's Bavaria. I think it's Bavaria. Yeah, this is Bavaria. So, um, I at my place I do the trichoderma. You know, we talked about doing dips and, and stuff like that. I do a dip in um, Biosear, um, Root Shield, which is Trichoderma, and then Nematodes. Okay. So any incoming plants get a full submersion, roots and everything. The whole thing goes in a tote with, you know, I do six gallons at a time and make up a super concentrate. And uh, that was one of the bug companies coached me on that recipe. Um, but there's a million. And sulfur is like a cheaper, easier way to go. Um, but if you're looking for more of like an organic or a, you know, a different approach, that's another option. Um, trichoderma to me is more as a inoculant after transplant or as a, as a dip, you know, it's a root protectant really. And I don't find it to have as much of a, you know, it's not hurting any bugs, but more giving you a stronger root system that will help you keep bugs away. Uh, healthy immune system. Yeah. I love trichoderma. I use it on every plant in my greenhouse. Two weeks after transplant, we drench everything with nematodes and, uh, Root shield. Great question. Uh, let's see, any other bugs? Yes, we got lots of other bugs. <laughs> I've got Aureus here. Aureus is the um, pirate bug. It's one of the bigger bugs you'll see. Um, this is great for adult thrips. They bite. They bite and they fly, which is great. So you don't have to go pot to pot. You can just dose a couple spots in the room. They'll move their way around. If I have thrips to a point where I'm seeing visible damage, I've got adults. I always throw this in the mix with the Swirsky to make sure that they have they can work together. Um, I've got some um, lacewing larvae here. These are ferocious little alligators that look for aphids. They're mainly looking for aphids, that's their favorite. But they'll eat thrips, they'll eat mites. Um, again, I generally only use either one of those on a curative basis, meaning I've got a problem I'm looking to treat. Um, they're more expensive and they're really like, they're great predators, um, but you know, again, really just use them on a curative basis. We, uh, rove beetle we talked about, great for fungus gnats, great for root aphids. It's going to also be one of the bigger bugs that you can visit. You open this bottle, you'll see them running around. Right. Um, they can fly, they can jump, they can hop from pot to pot. So they'll move their way around, which I like. Um, Do you ever water? The, I love those. You'll water, you'll be like, man, are they around? And then you water a pot. And you'll see them all come to the top. They're like running around. Yeah, they go to work. All right, so the uh, Stradio Laylaps, also one of my favorites. So Swirsky and Stradio, my favorite two bugs. Yeah. These will, together, they will cover 80% of your pests to 90%. Um, so this is a, a soil mite. It's really small. You would do it as a scoop right on the soil or media surface. Works in rock wool, works in cocoa, works in soil, it doesn't matter. Um, but these are awesome and cheap, I mean, comparatively to some of the other things. And on a per plant basis, you're doing on like a one gallon, you do maybe a teaspoon. On a three gallon, you do like a tablespoon. Um, Dylan laces his up heavy. So you can, I mean, he doesn't have a fungus gnat in sight, you know, I, and because of this. And if you're in cocoa and you're doing, you know, your, your dry backs and you're keeping things fairly moist, you're really creating the perfect spot for fungus gnats. So you need to have some tool in your tool belt to, to take care of those. And, um, those plus Swirsky are beautiful. Uh, we got nematodes, two different types. We got the new, yes. What was that last mic call again? This is Stradiolalaps. 
Soil mite. Soil mite. It, the old name was Hypoascus. Hypoascus Miles. Yeah. What do the soil mites do? What do they what? What do the soil mites eat? What do they eat? They eat fungus gnat larvae, root aphids, uh, thrip pupa in the soil. So really any of our soil based <laughs> pests. Before they uh, make it to the plant. Yep. Yeah. Alright, so we got the Steinemera felicia nematodes. I don't know if I'm saying it right, but that's how I say it. Um, you can get it two ways from us, either as this like pack that kind of looks like snot, and you'd mix this with water and drench or spray your plants with it. This is a package of 50 million nematodes. <clears throat> this would treat quite a few plants. I would treat this like 103 gallons, or you can go by square footage, but this can go pretty far. Um, you can also spray this, so I would spray my plants if I'm finding thrips. Um, and you mix this at a rate of 5 million per gallon of water and you would spray right on the foliage, do it with the lights off, but it's a great tool to, to fight the immature thrips. Or 50 million per gallon. Or, yeah, like it. yeah, or do it at, you know. <laughs> the beautiful part about bugs is you can't do it wrong in that you can't overdose on them, you know. Um, you would just waste your money. That's all. That, that's the only thing. Um, these are really cool. They just came out last year. These are a nematode capsule. And this is very specific to our company only. And you would do it as a, uh, a top dress after transplant. Uh, you can really do it anytime, but that's the easiest, most economical way to work it into your program. And you would do about 20 to 25 capsules per gallon of growing media. Um, there's about 200 capsules in this little uh, box right here, but you can also get in a much bigger box from us as well. Um, I think that's it for the main bugs. So, Let's see, preventative, let, let's keep going on the, the topic here. Preventative versus curative, we can go back one. Right. Um, it's cheaper, let's start with preventative. I mean, it's, it's all basic stuff we all know. Preventative is cheaper, it's easier. You're really thinking ahead, you're, you're analyzing what the potential problems are, and you're putting action in place to prevent it. Um, curative, you know, we're all used to putting out fires. I am still putting out fires. You know, you're, you're, you're dumping a lot at it. You're throwing everything you have at it. So it costs a lot more. It's much more intensive. Much more stressful. It's much more stressful. That's not on here. That's the thing I, I hate uh, when I'm in here. Deep breaths. Breath. Right? A lot of deep like, breaths. You know, in and out. We focus. Um, but yeah, it's it's a game that I don't like to play, and I'm slowly working my way out of that lifestyle. Who's here? Who here has had a curative problem going on where they're, they're battling something that's like out of control and... I don't know if you're married or you have a girlfriend. I'm trying to talk to you, and all I'm thinking about is the blank stare. Yeah. Where are you? All I can think about is like a root aphid in my mind. Right. Oh, it's like, how does it get in there? <laughs> yep. Uh, all right, you can go ahead on that one, and then skip the next one. Go ahead and skip that. All right. Um, so we kind of touched on this. This is, I, I, again, I put together plans based on specific requirements, but here's an example of a curative plan for aphids. And uh, going to be totally different than a preventative plan for everything. It would be totally different than a curative plan for thrips. So knowing your past and knowing what direction to go is like so important. And I just want to give you guys a couple examples of these. And I, again, am totally happy to make a plan for you guys specifically, whoever wants one anytime. Call the number, hit me up. I answer the phone. Um, go ahead. And this is going to kind of segue into you and me and talking about sprays and, you know, what we can do. You know, sprays are, you have to spray a little bit. You can't grow cannabis without doing zero. Cause you gotta manage your, your PM and you gotta do your reset and you gotta, you know, there's things you gotta do. So knowing your sprays and your options and what they're gonna do and how they're gonna work and how they're gonna play with these beneficials is very important. And that's the point of this next slide is we're gonna talk about the main products that we'll see, what they do and if they hurt the beneficials. Right. And, uh, you know, Dylan here is the Athena master, so I'll, I'll lean on him for any Athena related questions, but um, I know a lot of people are using IPM and that's a good tool to have in your tool belt. Yep. I think you should have lots of tools in your tool belt. Yep. You know, don't wait for the problem to like, like, oh God, I gotta go buy something. You know, <laughs> the products I put up here are different from each other and they have different modes of action. And so you should, I wouldn't say you have to own all of these, but you know, having something like IPM and something like Azagard are good complementary products that it will do slightly different things, but will hurt bugs, bad bugs. Um, the sulfur, that's a that's a very everyone should have sulfur. Yeah, I mean you got to do something for PM. Even if you don't have it, you should assume you're going to get it. Mm -hmm. And you know you're going to want to treat every two to three weeks. 
And when you're using beneficials, you can still spray. You just got to be strategic. So let's say I'm getting, I'm getting my beneficials on a Thursday. I'm going to spray Monday and I'm not going to spray again for two weeks after I release. Yep. So most of the bugs that I'm using have a two to three week lifespan. So we're going to assume that they're basically going to die off, you know, in two to three weeks after I release, which is what we want. You know, we're, we're hoping we don't have enough pest pressure where they have the resource to reproduce. You know, if, if you've got a lot of pests, they're going to, they're going to sit there and they're going to hang out and reproduce and get multiple life cycles. But most of the time that doesn't happen. So assume that every three weeks you're going to have to reapply. And that's why I use that kind of three week reapplication window, but you can also time your sprays that way. So, you know, spray, release, wait a bit, spray, release, wait a bit. And so working that into your plan, it, it's important. And uh, Dylan has the same kind of plan. We'll, we'll go into Dylan's program, exactly what he does. Um, so Spinosad we talked about, thrip specific, won't really hurt much else. Azagard is the um, derivative from neem oil, azadactrin, and it's a great like all-purpose killer of bugs. It's not super strong, so you know, you're gonna get some knockdown, but you're not gonna kill everybody. So if you're trying to kill some pests, don't assume one spray is gonna do it, and it's only gonna generally do one life stage. So like, you got thrips, and they've got eggs. You know, you just killed all the adults, but you left all the eggs. So, you know, four, six days later, you got a whole new wave of babies. So knowing that, and again, nothing is a one and done. So knowing that we'll just make calls accordingly. We either spray again, or we'll plan for the release to coincide with kind of the next, next hatching. Um, IPM, that's more what? Oil-based? Oil, yeah. All essential oil. Yep. yep. So that's going to be killing and preventing. It's, it's great. It's great prevention. Uh, it's great prevention. I use Athena IPM mostly as prevention. Um, and it can be used uh, for kill um, at a higher rate. Any of the oil-based products, you got to be very careful with, especially if you're trying to use oil-based and sulfur. Yeah, exactly. Very careful because you will do a lot more damage to your plants. Tell people how you can screw it up. As well. So, so here's here's how you screw it up, right? Yeah. So I'm gonna I'm, I've done this multiple yeah, times. Too. I'm gonna I'm, I spray IPM, right? And then I realize, oh shit, I got some pressure. Let's say, let's say I notice like russet damage, and I'm like, oh shit, I got to take action like the next day. And this is this is literally happened to me, and I rush because I'm panicking because now I'm in curative oh fuck mode, and I don't think and I don't think straight. And I grab sulfur, I mix it up in a sprayer, and I spray it right over plants. I just spray that have oil coating all over them. Mm. Yikes! It's like you know, I burn everything right up. You know, um, so typically, if, if you're using if you're using an oil base, you want to wash that off. Even if it's even if I spray oil base, because I use a combination of almost all of these products. I don't use the Azimax. I, I use all the others, um, and I'm very very careful when I'm using sulfur. I'm making sure typically for me, I'm going to use a Zeratol or even just an, an RO wash. Maybe I'll add some kelp in. I'm going and I'll do a foliar to make sure that I'm washing off. Um, there's products out there that uh, good soap products you can get as well. Kind of wash the grease. It's the same thing we're doing to our plants. When we coat them with oil, we're putting grease on them pretty much. Um, we want to wash all that oil off, right? Um, even if it's a week after I've sprayed, I'll still, I just because I've made that mistake before, I'll still wash my plants off before I spray sulfur. Right, so and backwards. What's that? Backwards, backwards. like doing sulfur. First. So, so backwards, uh -huh. you're not gonna you're not gonna run in. So we're, we don't have that coating of oil down. It's still, I want to wash. I like washing my plants before I switch between. If I'm going from oil to oil, like I sprayed Athena, ran out, had some leftover loss, Coast Plant Therapy, which is damn near identical. They're very mm -hmm. similar to oil base. Uh, you know, I'll I'll switch right over with no problem. With sulfur, I'm going to wash. Me personally, I'm washing either way, um, especially if you're going oil to sulfur. Yeah, oil to sulfur. Yeah, I noticed that there's sulfur on the plant, and you spray the oil base, you just paint it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, yeah, yeah. it, it, it it's and, it, you want to wash. Yeah. You know, a lot, a lot of people. Either way, wash. Yeah, the sulfur yeah. or the oil. Yeah, Better be safe than sorry. Yeah. I mean, that's the rest. That's everything in your garden. <laughs> yeah. There is a Athena has a. Um, if you go to, if you can scan like this bottle IPM, if you hit the QR code. There is a sulfur, there is a sulfur IPM spray routine on there, like an oh, SOP. Yeah. Just follow that and you'll be good. Yeah. If you're using those two products. And that's really what I that's those are the two I use the most. Um, you know, as far as sprays. Sulfur probably yeah. being the predominant one. Yeah. Because the bus the, the bugs that I battle on a routine basis, 
for me, which may be different for you, are mostly are, are going to be cured by sulfur or prevented by sulfur, the things that I battle the most. Uh, it's not regular sulfur. They already got these mic mic micronized. Yeah, because yeah, I've seen it. This, this right sulfur. here, no. this right here is yeah, all I use. This is, is everyone should have. It's and for the price, it goes, I mean, that's like, what, I think right. 75 bucks for that bag. And it's, yeah, dude, that's going to last years. You, if you're going through more than that in a small garden, we got bigger problems. <laughs> you know, that, that, that stuff goes a long way. We sell one pound and five pound containers. Do you have one and five pound? Nice. Yeah, nice. Yeah, uh, yeah, anywhere from 15 to 30 grams per gallon. I mean, really, I do 15. Uh, you can go up to 30, you know, uh, more you spray. The higher dosage you go. It will, you know, I, I went a little too hot before and yeah. you will kind of get a little burning or browning on like new growth, uh, especially, and, and it'll grow right out of that. Uh, 15 grams per gallon of, of that specific brand is, is my go-to, 15 grams per gallon. So, good, yes. Uh, when will you stop spraying that before flowers? Um, I, so there's, yeah, everybody one. will say, yeah, everybody will say different things. Yeah. Um, some, some people that spray sulfur personally, for me, I don't like spraying past day seven to 10 of flower. Mm -hmm. So, um, I will do a day one and day seven, uh, preventative cure, um, or like prevention. Um, you know, for me, if you go past that, there's a couple things that, that can happen. If you spray too late with sulfur for one, you can get, if you, I've had this, a friend of mine had this happen to him, he sprayed, you know, mid twenties, your, your weed's gonna come out and taste like sulfur. If you got, and nobody wants that. You don't want the sulfur pack, you know. Um, number two, and this this is something I just learned in the last year, you spray past day 14, you're, you will you will greatly increase the, the chance to hermit out your entire garden. So um, that, and that, that, that was new information to me this year as well. Um, so yeah, I really am trying to, to keep me. that. Yeah. Well, my man. Uh, day, 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 under day 10, preferably day one and seven, you know. Yes, sir. So what about drenching with sulfur? Because, like, I know sulfur mm. will, uh, improve, doesn't improve like tile. Yeah, I mean, I've never had to. I don't know what I would be drenching for with sulfur. Um, you know, I mean, my, my experience well, like, with. I mean, like, what about, like, potassium sulfate? What's that? Like, Right. Yeah. You. I mean, you can drench with it. I just don't know what I would be going after with pests. Like, like, like you're, you're looking at it from a nutrient yeah. standpoint, right? Yeah. 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 I'm, I'm sure you can. I, I. I guess I've never really had to drench a sulfate for any well, reason. Like, but I'm sure you could. Well, like me and uh, Nick talked about the diametaceous earth yep. and the silica and the diametaceous earth, and yeah. Yeah. I mean, a lot of these products will have a little something yeah. extra in them. Sometimes it's good. For sometimes really, bad. It's a good one. I mean, even spraying the sulfur on your plants. Do plants? You ever? You ever want your room after your plants sprayed sulfur? The next those plants love it. I mean, that sulfur is a good, a good thing, you know, yeah. for sure to the plant. Yeah. Um, I've never had to drench it, um, no. but uh, I really try to personally stay away from drenching, you know, you, oil-based products. There are SOPs you can follow, even with our Athena's IPM to root drench. That, to me, is a last ditch. I am not root drenching any oils in my plants no. unless I'm at a point where I got something that I can't lose. And to be honest with you, if I'm at that point, I'm probably going to go to a a, a kill shot if I need to say something. I'm not using that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not because it won't work. It's because it's very, when you put oils in your root zone, if you're not um, spot on with everything that you're doing, you, you will do a lot of damage to that plant for sure. So um, it's risky. But When you dunk with the sulfur, do you do it at the same grams per gallon? Versus yeah, flood. yeah, I do. I do dunks at the same, and, and, and sometimes, and again, I'll I'll give it a range. I don't always stay at fifteen. I'll kind of wobble between like fifteen to like twenty, fifteen to twenty-five. If I get cuts in from somebody, I'm going at twenty-five. Mm -hmm. I don't trust nothing from nobody. Um, and uh, I made that mistake, like many of us. Doesn't matter if it's my best friend or a stranger on the street. If I bring in a genetic, I'm definitely going to go a little heavier on the dunk. Just assume it has roughly. Assume, assume it has everything. Assume it has everything. Always. Assume it has everything. Always. Always. Uh, get, get yourself. I actually use uh, VPD domes. I bought an extra one, and I just use that as my quarantine tent. Now when I get clones in, I got it. And I can put it in a hallway. I don't even have to have it in my same area. It, it, it's keeping everything closed, and that, that's where I'll dunk and let them set and root, and everything is separate when I take in, in cuts, because I've made that mistake, I can't tell you how many times, bringing in clones from people and oh, yeah. your garden. having issues. Yeah, the, again, I, I, and my veg is, veg rooms are, are the, um, are that, that's the engine, right? The mm -hmm. engine, the, the flowering to me is the easy part. Bedroom protocols are what, what have to be buttoned really, really, really yeah. tight. Mm -hmm. So, um, my, my, for routine and veg, foliar spray, I like to spray food as well. 
Um, the, the combo I use is, is up on the up on the screen. Go to the uh, next slide, it'll pop up for me. There oh, you. there we go. Um, I like to feed as well as spray. I'm on a two week on and off, like he talked about spray prevention. Um, I'm I'm gonna be spraying. Uh, Athena IPM, typically uh, there are times of the year where I will switch to sulfur, specifically during the winter months in Michigan when it's colder. Uh, and somebody brought the powder mildew thing up. I know from being a Michigan resident my entire life, the climate we deal with out here, that during the fall to, to spring, that, that time frame where it starts to cool down in Michigan is, is where I'm gonna be at risk for powder mildew, right? Uh, uh, mildew loves what? Cold and damp right it wants high humidity and cooler temperatures um so i will switch over for the most part to using sulfur during the winter months um and and, and for that reason um and and regardless of what i'm spraying i'm always on a two week um i'm on a two week application so i'll spray i'll usually spray like he said usually two to three days before i know my bugs are coming i'll get a good spray in if i'm feeling any pressure at that point um i will do a strip down if, let's say if i'm seeing some Grip damage on leaves, I will strip them off, whether it's one or none, or two or 10. And then I'll usually hit anywhere from one, one treatment or maybe two to three days in a row before my bugs show up. And then I'm gonna deploy whatever, whatever uh, bugs I ordered. Um, and then I will hit them again in two weeks. And I just keep that same routine. Um, on my clones, I will also use, I've gotten a habit of using like even Swirsky sachets. If I'm about, and sometimes it's just, I'll see something I don't like, or I'm going to take clones, for instance, and I start hacking clones and I see thrip damage, like on a leaf. It could just be one leaf and I'll, I'll start itching. And I'm like, yeah, like <laughs> and yeah, I, I feel dirty yeah. and I, I'm like, you know what? I got extra Swirskis. I'm gonna scuff a bunch of these domes when I dome my clones and let them just, just annihilate anything that's in there and try to get that, that, that break, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, but typically I'm using Swirsky I'm using the Australia Lay Laps Heavy and Veg. Those, if I'm using those two uh, at routinely in Veg, I hardly ever see anything out of outside of a oh shit, there's a little damage from a, a thrip on a leaf randomly or whatever, right? I hardly ever see gnats and Veg um, because of the Australia Lay Laps. I, I keep that pretty heavy. Nematodes, I used to use a lot more of until I got on a good preventative plan. Now that I was talking with Nick about this when I was at his place the other day. Now that I'm at, on a preventative plan, I've got to back off the nematodes a lot, right? Because for me, in my garden, if I can't, if I start to see that activity continue to increase with, with the regimen that I routinely do, that's when I'll call in, okay, I need, I can send me four fifty million packs for next week. I'm seeing a little bit too much. I want to really knock them back and that's when I'll, I'll bring in nematodes, right? Uh, nematode drenching is, you got a large bedroom, is, is extremely time consuming, right? Um, to what he talked about earlier with my time is valuable and, and uh, if I have to apply nematodes, I know it's going to be um, it's going to be a full day for me. I have to do every plan individually. You have to mix, mix up batches. Everything should be hand, hand applied um, or sprayed. Um, and, I, and I'm gonna do mostly root drenching with nematodes. And I'll just touch on the fact that like, you know, Dylan does it the right way. It doesn't mean that you have to do, if you do nematodes, you can run them through a pump. Yep. You can run them through drippers. I mean, it's, it's not your best practice. Um, you will still get efficacy out of them, but the way he does it where he mixes up a, a stock tank and hand ladles each pot is gonna give you the best result, but like, it's not feasible for everybody. No. And it's not feasible for every grow. And if you're like on a double tier or you're doing, you know, it just, it doesn't always work. So um, know that you have that option. Here's the deal with nematodes, the best practices. You get your nematodes, you're planning to do a drench. You get, let's say you're gonna mix up 50 gallons of water to, to evenly irrigate all your plants with these nematodes. You'd get a five gallon bucket and fill it up halfway with, with room temperature RO water or tap water, doesn't matter. Um, you would throw your whole package of nematodes in there and mix it up really good. Come back five minutes later, mix it up again. Do that two more times. So like 15 minutes, let it just chill. That wakes them up and then you dump that into your big tank of 50 gallons, yep. mix that up and then go and apply. Um, I was doing it wrong for probably eight years and was just like throwing them right in there, dosatroning them out. Like, so it took me a while to figure it out. And once I started doing it right, I was like, oh shit, these things work. Cause I wasn't really getting anything out of them. I was still fighting gnats. And so 
that was a big aha moment for me. It was like doing nematodes the right way and letting them wake up in this kind of room temperature setting. Why don't you touch on that while running? Yeah, we talked about the acid. Acid. hyperchlorous acid and nematodes. Yeah. So that does so, okay, question. I great, get great question. So number one thing is like, what do nematodes do? That, that's kind of the essence of the question. Nematodes, you mix them with water, you drench your plants. The nematodes that come in contact with that pest will, will infect it. They'll burrow their way into the body of the larva of the um, fungus gnat and infect it internally. Um, the hypochlorous acid will kill the nematodes, but the nematodes are really only active in that moment of drench. So once they dry out, they die. So you activate them in water, you drench them in, they infect whatever they can, your media dries out, they're dead. So whether you hypochlorous them afterwards or not, my feeling is like, get your nematode, don't use hypochlorous for a day or two before and after, let them work, and then go back. You can totally use them together, but just not in that same moment. I get that question a lot. Obviously, uh, hypochlorous acid is, Athena makes a product called Cleanse, that's what it is, it's hypochlorous acid. Um, and uh, I get that's probably one of the most common questions I get regarding uh, beneficial bugs is, what about Cleanse with, with, with nematodes? And uh, what Nick, Nick just said is, is, is holds true. Um, I know a few commercial grows that have done like you know studies and looked at activity and it will, it's not gonna kill off an entire population. If you, if you, let's say if I, if I just throw, you know, 200 million nematodes in a big res that's already got Athena products in there, right? I got my pro line, it's all mixed up. I'm using five milligallon cleanse. Is it gonna be ineffective? No, it's gonna cut the motility down. I'm gonna waste some money doing it. Yeah, Typically, if I'm planning a drench though, I'm gonna stop using hypochlorous acid two days before. I'm gonna apply my nematodes and then I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna start apply uh, go back to my hypochlorous acid two days after. So I'm gonna stop two days before. I'm gonna start back up two days after because nematodes are gonna kill 90 percent on that first pass through. <coughs> yeah. First pass through, mm -hmm. you know. And I'll I'll let them I'll let them chill residual for two days and go right back to feeding eight or hypochlorous acid if 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 you're using that. So sir in the back and then we'll get you in a second. Yes sir. Does the hypochlorous acid uh, kill the soil mites? No, no, you know, it's not going to hurt any of these big-bodied organisms. It's really hypochlorous acid is geared towards microbials. Yeah. Okay. You know, so it's really the fungal, the bacteria. So um, it's going if you use it at a high enough rate and you're running an ORP, let's say over 450, you should naturally see less uh, soil-borne larva. You know what I mean? Or you know, I run a very, very, very sterile in veg. I cut back when I get into flower, but I run extremely sterile, high hypochlorous acid in veg because it's gonna keep all, any, any root-borne illnesses away, which is going to cause, if my root zone's weak, yeah. if, if I'm dirty, if I'm full of algae, if I'm, you know, whatever, I'm gonna attract yeah. stuff, right? And so I wanna remain extremely sterile for me. That, that's the way that I garden, uh, but I'm also in rock or cocoa. If you're a soil gardener and you have microbial life and you're inoculated, you're not gonna to wanna to use that, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's not, that's just gonna defeat everything you did. It's gonna kill out everything you just did. I got, uh, let me get my man right here and then you next, yep. So question, because we're using the cleanse in the dosatron. Yep. Mm -hmm. So if we're watering in the nematodes, do you suggest turning the cleanse off for a couple of days? Yeah, so so I run dosatron set up a lot of my, oh, yes, I just go click that, just go click it off. Okay. Yep, we'll click it off two days before, let it feed like normal, and if you're running any of the Athena products, or any salt-based product, you're not gonna see uh, like buildups or something go wrong in four days. Okay. You know, they're, most of these lines are extremely clean. Yeah. Specific, Athena is extremely clean on its own. Um, the hypercoarse acid is, it serves a couple purposes. One, it keeps your root zone sterile. Number two, it keeps your irrigation system. It's kind of like the engine oil for your irrigation system. It's gonna keep it running smooth, clean. It's gonna, it's not gonna allow for bacteria and stuff to, to build up inside of your lines and biofilms. But in four days, you're not gonna see, it's not gonna hurt anything. So, great question, go ahead. Oh, my, my question is similar to hers is, uh, when um, like when you're in dirt um, for, like when you're reintroducing your microbials, mm -hmm. is it better to offset the microbials from the actual nematodes or any infestation or does it not? That's a great question. A lot of growers that are using my, microbials incorporate the nematodes into the micro microbial day. Okay. So they'll mix that, because you can mix nematodes into Right. fertilizer like right. they're they're very you know versatile so it's beneficial too. it is yeah. and it's you know making your life easier adding it to, the, to a time when you're already doing the drench is like huge yeah. Yeah. Right. um so yeah. totally great question and yeah come on in there
If you're gonna pump feed the nematodes, yeah, could you just toss them in your res with your Athena Pro and just do it all in the same feed? Yeah, I, I've done it. I just did it. I called him the other week because I haven't been using nematodes as much, and I had these. I knew that I had these around for a couple of weeks. I'm like, man, I'm these are. I got. I'm not gonna throw them away. I paid for them. You know what I mean? So. I dude, I got 50 gallons. I put like 150 million in a 50 gallon resin center right through my irrigation. Now, now impellers are going to cut down the life, right? Yeah. There's certain things along the way through irrigation that are going to you're not going to get that full amount. It's still better than it's not, it's a numbers game. and it's a time saver. We're putting 150 right? million, like well, okay, we lose 25 percent. We still got 100 yeah. million coming out. You know right. what I mean? <laughs> So they're pretty, they're pretty inexpensive too. So yeah, a yeah. Of no, yeah. You, and, and they do they do a great job. I mean, if I can, I like to top feed because I like to totally saturate. And, and personally, I always apply nematodes. If I'm drenching, you want to make sure I like to do it after my P1 irrigation. If I'm in a flower room, yeah. I want my plants to adjust, hit good runoff for the day. I'll usually try to wait like an hour so they dry back just a little bit, and then so I don't have to apply because you need to get full saturation. So if you do it on a dry pot, guess what? You better have a lot of solution ready with nematodes, <laughs> right? And if it's already been saturated for the day, I can put one nice ladle on every pot, yeah. hit my, my good runoff, it'll, it'll get, and, and they want that wet environment to work. Mm -hmm. That's how they work, yep. that's how they move. Yeah, they move you know? exactly. So being a little bit strategic on how you lay them, but I ran them through drippers a lot. You know, I just, I just usually go a little bit above. Yeah. I'll add a little bit more. Yes, sir. So if you say they drive in a wet environment, no, just to know that they're active in moisture. So like when you buy, when you open that package, it looks kind of, I don't even know what a good comparison is, but it's, yeah, it's, once you mix them with water, they, they come to life. And they're kind of in like hibernation mode right here where they're dried out and they kind of cool them off. Um, but once you get them wet, they're alive. And once they dry out, they die. But don't try to keep them alive longer than they would naturally be because they're only gonna we, we touched on this earlier they're, they're 90 percent of their kill is going to be that first pass through yeah. they don't hang out for like they're two weeks and kill and things yeah because your plants and and and, and, I, and I think we all know this by now i mean it's pretty common knowledge but if you're dealing with fungus gnats the last thing you want to be doing is over watering and keeping exactly. shit too wet because that's what fungus gnats love yeah, yeah, yeah no, you know? i just didn't want to be like having an intense dry back like 35 percent and then just immediately well, I mean, like, again, for me, I don't, I don't, I look at nematodes as that day. Yeah. Whenever I kill that day and I go right back to normal dry backs. And, yeah. you know, I'll, I'll hit them. I'll wait till my P1's done for the day, hit good runoff, apply them, you know, do a, do a very thorough application on the whole room. They killed what I needed to at that point. Next day, I'm going right back to normal dry backs. Exactly. They're done for me. I'm, I, you know, I mean, I, I, I'm not going to keep my pots wet to try to keep them around for that residual ten right. percent yep. because I want it, that drying out process it's huge. Of, of those pots is huge for getting a, naturally getting away larva in your soil. Yeah, you know most larvae love the, the wet conditions. Yeah, you know so and and that one piece right there can like I I go to a lot of grows where they're just overwatering and that's like the essence of the problem and and adjust and knowing that can reduce the the population just because they're not going to be as happy in that situation same with root aphids like you know you, you your plants become compromised they're drinking less you're still watering the same amount and eventually you lead to this constant saturation and your plants are just going to keep suffering root aphids are going to keep getting worse keep so you got to manage that and know that you know you want to get that good dry back it's so important to get those roots healthy yeah 100%. <clears throat> So, so yeah, you, this is your specific like. Yep, yep. So this this is what I this is what I do. And I, now this is again this is this is um this is all my prevention, right? So uh, the uh, nematodes uh, five million per light. I go really really heavy. So I go extremely extremely heavy. Now nematodes, I'm gonna root drench to full saturation. We just went through um, that entire routine. If I have the time, I'm gonna mix with our O water. Uh, one thing that he said is very very important. That's not listed here. When I initially make that batch up, I make a strong five gallon stock tank batch in like just a bucket with RO water. And then I'll dump, let's say I got four rows in my room. I'll dump a quarter of that into another five gallon bucket. I'll mix it with our RO water and, and I'll apply. It's very important that about every five minutes as you're applying, you need to keep stirring. I have a piece of, I use that, um, those straight pieces that Florifex sells in a 17 millimeter tubing or a piece of PVC, just a small piece. I just use that to, to spin my my uh, 
my um, five gallon bucket about every five minutes because they will settle to the bottom. 100%. They Very will settle to the bottom. Piece. So you want to keep agitating them and keep scooping and, and lay them all out. Um, now that has went from prevention. Uh, that's part of my, that's not part of my, I don't need that as part of my prevention process right now because I've got to a point where I, 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 I've stabilized right a lot to where now I'm, I'm going through that process. If I see my threshold levels go above an acceptable level for me, then my, for me specifically with, with fungus gnats, the first thing I'm going to go to is adding in, uh, going back to the, to the nematodes. Um, the soil mice, the Australia lay, lay laps has been a big part of me being able to get away from and, and applying them properly all the time is, is allowed me to back off the nematodes, which now I'm saving money, right? So sometimes with IPM, you're going to spend more out of the gate to get stabilized. And then once you get on a prevention plan, it's, it, you're, my cost went in half over the last six months because I've stabilized. I've worked with Nick, I've got on a better plan, um, really tried to look at like, what is the heartbeat and, and what do I what do I need and where, when and why? Uh, I've identified that, so I've been able to back off some things like nematodes. But I know if I go above a certain threshold and it could just be seeing some fly, I go down to water a plant and I get hit in the face by five flyers and I'm like, no, that's too much for me. I'm, I'm getting some nematodes on my next order. But right now and for the last couple months, I haven't had to apply hardly at all with nematodes because I'm applying a lot of soil lights. So I do those at 5K per light. Again, that's heavy, five, that's 5,000 per light. So if I'm doing, um, typically I get, was it 250,000? Yeah. I get the bag of 250,000 is what I order all the time. And I think this is like, this is 10,000. So he gets a lot more. And I do, uh, I do a heaping spoonful on every plant. Um, if I'm in, if I'm in um, veg, I kind of sprinkle them all over the place. I'll even put them right in the foliage. I'll yeah. just dust them into the foliage. Chicken feed them out. Yeah, chicken feed it out in veg. When I'm in, when I get into a flower room, uh, you know, I'm, I'm applying right away. Uh, one of the biggest times that I apply these these soil mites are the Australia lay laps for me. The most important, crucial time. Veg should be continuous. Should be all the time. You should be in a plan that never breaks, in my opinion. Veg. Veg room for me. My routines are always the same. I never have flowering plants. I should be on. A, on, on you should be on the same routine of veg. For the most part when i get into flower i'm, I'm using these bugs at, at when i bring plants into a clean room i lay day one with trailer lay lap i'm laying day one because again i know the biggest things that i battle are on the on the constant are going to be gnats and thrips and that's because of uh where i live my surroundings what's around me you know i know what i'm going to be battling um so i'll lay those day one because i will again i want to set the pace for that day one i want them in the room before I let things start to kind of get out of control, I want to have a good prevention plan, so I'll lay those day one. Um, and then I go, into, uh, I go into a spray routine usually for the first, for the first 10 days. I'm spray heavy um, because after day 10, I don't like to spray my plants with anything if I can help it, unless I'm in a, in a curative phase where I'm like, oh shit, I need to spray up to day 21 for whatever reason it is. Let's say I have too much thrip damage and the bugs aren't working and I got to go spray. But typically, if, if I'm in prevention, I'm going to spray heavy day day one through ten, and then after that, I'm I'm just only going to apply beneficials. Uh, Sorsky mites, I apply usually one to two sachets per plant, depending on the size, and I, I like to apply those right after strip, right? So I'm going to go in, I'm going to strip all my plants down, and again, this is if I'm not seeing anything out of the ordinary, um, I, and then I I, I lay my I lay uh, more Australia lay laps right after strip. I do another round of those, and then Sorskys. And that's prevention for me. Now I have bodyguards out there fighting a battle for me for the next three weeks through the heartbeat of, of everything, right? I will apply again at the end of flower like I, I am right now in a room at day 45 because I know I have Swirskis. I see damage a little bit. I'm sorry, uh, I have um, thrip damage here and there. So I'm going to lay more Swirskis to keep things where they are because right now it's, it's not out of control. I'm good, but I don't want it to get out of control. But typically... If I'm not seeing anything mid flower, when I know that that last application that week at day 21 is wearing off, I won't apply again. I don't need to. Yeah. Right? We're almost to the end. Yeah, usually so. it's, it's like week three is your last application unless you're fighting something. And that's the mindset you should have is like, I don't really want to put any good bugs out past week four. We want to assume that everything's gonna, all of our good guys are going to be dead at harvest. So that's the, the second thing that you just don't want to apply yeah. too far unless you have a problem like I'm saying. And, you know, he's got more trips than he wants, so he's gonna put one more dose of Swirsky Sachets just to keep him from getting out of control at the end, and that's the only move he's gotta make. It's, it's crazy, when you start using beneficials a lot, doesn't mean that you're never gonna have a problem. 
But the cool thing about it and what I've seen, and I'm, I'm very open and transparent about, about my garden. I don't care sharing problems. And anyone that ever tells me they've never had a bug or a problem, Skeeter hasn't been growing that long or they don't have <laughs> see very clearly. I mean, um, I, I, will, I, will, um, I will still see stuff pop up. You know, I mean, I want to say it was probably about a year ago. I was cleaning out a mom room, and, you know, we're, we just got done taking clones. And I pulled my mom out, and my, my, my worker at the time was like, Hey, I, you know, there's some, there's this bottom branch is done and right away. I was like, fucking russets, like, right. Cause I've been through this a hundred times with, with russets. If I ever hear a brown dudding or dudding, or I see it, my first thought is, is russets, right? So we clipped that branch off. We went and scoped it. Sure enough, russets. Okay. Now the cool thing is it, no one wants to see that, but the awesome thing about being, I'm on a good beneficial routine. So even if I have something like that happen, it stay, we scoped the entire rest, all the clones, all the rest of the plants in that room, all the rest of the moms, nothing. So they stay isolated. Why? Because I have 9,000 bodyguards in there keeping them. They popped up somehow. Obviously, I didn't apply enough. Something wasn't right, but I don't ever get anything that streams out of control. You know what I mean? I haven't had to chop a whole room down because I had something that was so out of control. I will still get isolated things that pop up. Um, I take in a lot of genetics. Um, that's, a, that's the biggest part of my issues are genetics that I take in. No matter how much I dunk, no matter how much I, and I will get lackluster on homies coming over and walking in my garden, right? Taking off my shoes, making sure that I'm always putting on, you know, my, my, my mocks that I wear in my garden. I'll get lazy and walk from my house out to my barn and uh, it ain't no big deal. And it's all the stuff like that, the breaks in my routine that will lead to me having, having issues and bringing things in. Um, indoor gardening is very controlled. It's not like outdoor where we're, we're at the, we're at the, you know, mercy of mother nature and what's going on that year. You know, Nick mentioned it earlier. We didn't have a good th uh, freeze this year. We had a very mild winter. So y'all better get ready for what's about to come our way pest wise. Mm -hmm. You know, I've, I've started to apply more even indoor because I know the pressures that we're going to have coming from outside this year. We did not get a freeze. Michigan, the beauty of Michigan is usually we get a four to five foot freeze in the ground, which kills off everything. We get, we get our own reset, like a room reset. We get a reset for Michigan every year. We didn't get that this year. We stayed, we did not get that cold. We, our frost levels weren't that, that, that uh, deep this year. So I expect there to be a lot of pressure, both inside and out. Yep. You know, if you're, if you're gardening outside this year, especially. Yeah, so. even inside. I mean, just, you know, going in every spring, assuming that things are gonna get worse and they're gonna peak in the summer. And like, you just have that knowledge in the back of your mind. It's, it's a different game and just don't get complacent. And, you know, IPM, you're thinking of the seasons, you're thinking of more than just What's right in front of you in the garden it's like thinking ahead and yep. trying to factor all that stuff in there who here has a lot of pine trees around their grow yeah if you got a lot of pine house. trees expect expect a lot of thrips all i mean just just you should know that you know um a friend of mine's got pine trees all around the spot we trade a lot of genetics i just always know that that's going to be a threat he sees pressure lc pressure um, I've cut down most of mine. I don't have any more. Once I learned that, the chainsaw came out. Uh, part of my best prevention plan. Them trees went bye-bye. Um, treating the outdoors, some stuff we haven't touched on that, that we should going into to this year uh, before we transition over to some of the more grow-related stuff. You know, also, you know, if you're if you're growing indoors or if, even if you're growing outdoors, you're in hoop houses, greenhouses, you know, preventing and spraying the area around, right? Like your buildings, I, I spray, I will use pesticides around the outdoors of my building, perfectly fine turf turf stuff. Um, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a, a plethora of stuff that I use to spray outside of my buildings to keep stuff from coming into my buildings. That's perfectly fine, you should be using that. Um, I have mouse traps around all of my buildings, I don't want, I mean, treat them like, you know, like you, you what if you owned a food facility? I don't want that shit in my food. I don't want any of that in my cannabis either, right? So um, I have mouse traps around all my buildings. Um, we start spraying usually as soon as the, we start seeing buds on the trees outside, you know, we start spraying outside around, around the perimeter, um, you know, and same thing if you have hoop houses or if you have greenhouses, you have an outdoor plot, you know, do you have ground cover? That's very important, right? Um, you know, are you keeping all your foliage cut down? What's around you? What's in the field next door? What What do you have out back? What What else could be bringing in press pressure, right? And trying to keep that stuff away. So, um, just some some things to think about as well. So, and I mean, just having a good sanitation protocol for your room 
is, I mean, just the cornerstone to keeping things clean. Yeah. And, and like you said, just following it. I mean, it's easy to set one up. It's a little harder to actually like do it all the time. And it's that one time that you're like, well, fuck it. I'm just going to go in is the time where you bring in something. And, uh, so a good garden has a really good sanitation protocol as far as how you're coming in, how you're going out, who you're letting in, what, what the criteria is. Um, you know, he's got a whole round of shoes on the ground waiting for any guests to come in. If I go to a garden, I bring a separate pair of clothes that are fresh out of the, the you know, washing machine, take a shower before I, like, I take it very seriously. Yeah. And I know I'm a walking bug, so, like, I, you know, I, I take it very, very seriously. Typically, the only time I let anybody in my rooms um, is either the last week of flower. At that point, I'm, you know, I'm home free, and typically the people I'm letting in are, are going to be either taking pictures or a friend of mine or, or whatever the case may be, right? Um, if I, I don't typically let anybody in my rooms unless I have to be in there prior to that ever. And hardly anybody, unless they're working on a piece of equipment, ever goes in my bedroom, period. You know, and that's, that's, that's uh, it's hard to, am I perfect? You know, do I, do I break that sometimes? Yes, I do. Um, I'm all, you know, I have contractors that got to go in rooms. I have friends that kind of come over sometimes and help me with something. And uh, you just got to, got to be smart. You know, the more times you open a grow room door, the more times you're opening up your risk for bringing something in. So, um, you know, typically even on like a flower room, um, you know, if we have to do work in there, or even if I'm doing garden checks, you know, we're going to do garden checks, right? When lights come on, we're going to verify irrigations are taking place, whatever. We're going to, we're going to be in and out. I'm not going in that grow room to look at weed plants 16 times a day, no matter how cool they are. And every time I do that, right. And, and I used to have a knack for like, I'll fucking go smoke something. And I start thinking, I'm like, man, I want to go back and look at, it, and I'll just take trips in and out of my rooms. And every time I do that, I'm at risk for bringing something in and, and, uh, trying to get out of some of those bad habits. I acquired a lot of bad habits over the years, like over the, the years and years of growing that had to be like, I, I, this is a, sometimes, you know, pain is a motivator, right? The stress of having an infestation, having to chase powder mildew for the last four weeks, spraying it with everything under the gun. I mean, I, I remember spraying plants with milk. Remember when that, you thought that was a good idea? What the absolute fuck, you know what I mean? I mean, <laughs> so much stuff I look back that, I, that I've done and I'm just like, uh, man, you, you learn through pain. And, and I, I uh, definitely have been points in my life where I was, I didn't think that like beneficials were worth it. I would spray until I got back on a good, um, you know, I'd, I'd have everything free and clear. And I'm like, okay, I'm two months later after spraying and spraying and spraying, I get back to square one and then I wouldn't have a prevention plan. And then three months later here, I got another infestation I got another problem and I'm back to that, that chasing that fire. So uh, getting out of that routine has been a blessing. Um, it's been it's been a lot of years since I've had any real like, holy shit, I got to cut down a whole room or I got to reset my my veg for me. I don't know about everybody. Everybody else is everybody's a little different in their scale and what they have going on. And you know, for myself and and you know and uh, my my business, you know, my genetics are the uh, my bedroom is more important. I fucking let a flower room burn down before I I, I want to have a problem with my bedroom. You know, I will gladly cut a flower room down. My bedroom, I would have a very hard time doing. I pride battle it to the bitter end if I had a problem in there, you know. Um, and that's just because the genetics are, are you know, your bedroom is uh, is, is the heartbeat. It, it is, right? Um, you know, veg sets up flower runs. Veg also holds all your, your genetics, that some of which costs a lot of money. So, um, yeah, my, 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 uh, my focus is in veg. And what he said earlier, if you have a good veg routine and you're following that impermittably into flower, you're getting a good reset in that flower room, you should hardly ever have some catastrophic failure unless ISOPs aren't in place and we're letting people in and they bring things in, right? Me personally, early flower guys, you should you, you don't need people in there. The only times people should be going in your rooms are to work. Early flower especially, because everybody should be out. Go in there to strip leaves, go in there and do whatever you gotta do. If you got people that help you, that's it. Make sure they're clean, make sure they're not. Um, I don't really allow people to go into my gardens that garden. You garden, can't have you in my room, period. You know, most of my workers do not, my, my workers actually, my, yeah, my workers don't garden and they can't have a grow. Because I, again, I'm, I'm, I'm at risk, right? I don't know what you got going on. I can't, I can only worry about what I got going on. I can't worry about what other people have going on, you know? So try to be mindful when I'm going on other people's rooms too, um, because cross contamination shoes, number one, are probably the biggest thing you gotta, gotta watch out for, you know, so. Anybody else got any other questions where we transition over into like some more like grow cultivation stuff? 
you were talking about like threshold levels and what's acceptable, like for indoors, like. It's, it's 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 different for everyone's level of like I call it the itch factor. What makes you start to itch? For me, it don't take much. My threshold levels are my threshold levels are pretty low. Um, I don't really want to see much activity. I, I I have fly traps or sticky traps in the corners of my rooms. Like he said, one per bench. And man, if I see like if I go two or three weeks with seeing none, then all of a sudden I see five, I'm gonna go into freak out. Yeah, I'm I'm right. going to, okay. Whatever I laid, we're time for a re up, or maybe I gotta go to nematodes or whatever it is. Um, obviously, my threshold levels for things outside of, you know, thrips and mites is very, I have zero tolerance, you know. Um, if I see mite damage or whatever, I'm going to go ballistic with beneficials. I am, I'm going to treat everything, especially veg. If I see a problem in flower, like right now I got some thrips in one of my flower rooms. I have nothing in veg. But because I saw that in flower, I went ballistic on veg with, with beneficials because that's, I just, I don't ever want, I'd rather spend a hundred bucks throw some more in there, be preventative, then let that go, and all of a sudden now I got a problem and... that is gonna cost me more time and, and headache to get rid of. So I would identify whatever you're comfortable with. Um, you should be very little once yeah. you get on a good playing ground. So if you're seeing damage, then you're you're above the threshold usually. Yep. Um, but I mean, it's it, like you said, it's per person and there's no benchmark in the industry that says like, you got four thrips in a square, like that's above the threshold, you need to go spray. But it's, it's per person, and, and certain people are like, if I got one threat, that's my threshold. Mm-hmm. You know, So it's really dependent on the person and the situation, and indoor versus outdoor, and where yeah. you're at in the cycle. And a good way to tell if you're, like, if you go in your flower room, everybody has fans. If you look at your wall next to your fan, and it looks like a giant sticky trap, it's just covered with splatter pass, bro, you're <laughs> way above threshold level. <laughs> way above. That's the first thing I look at when I go to people grows. I'm like, where's your fan at? I'm gonna look at the wall. And that's gonna tell me what I need to know, because those things are gonna suck up and splatter and everything that's going on in your room. you know. And, and I look at my fans, my walls next to my fans all the time, more than I do sticky traps. Matter of fact, there's some rooms around you don't have sticky traps anymore because I know my shapers are gonna tell me exactly what's going on. Those are my shredders, and I'm gonna look at the wall right next to them. It's gonna tell me exactly what's going on in my room. You know, so fan blades, filters to your dehues, filters to your air handlers. If I see any activity in, in those, those are all for me sticky traps, and, and so to speak, right? Anything that sucks air in, dehues suck air in through a filter. Air handlers suck air in through through a through a filter, right? Those are all places to look for activity and all things that should be replaced every single room, you know, too, as well. So, any other, Rob, back there? What's up, bud? What's going on? So, uh, I got a buddy who's been dealing with russet mites for a very long time. Is there, like, a curative process for him to go through to actually get rid of those russet mites? I mean, russets, russet mites, I mean, sulfur's your best friend. 100%. 100%. Sulfur is your best friend. Uh, and then, uh, you know, laying, well, I'd say, well, I know for me, I'm, if I have a russet in my in my veg, I, I, I'm i going hard on sulfur. Like multiple applications, multiple applications, multiple applications. Probably going to then reclone, take down, dunk sulfur again, and, and try to get a fresh reset of veg. Um, russets are... They used to be a lot more scary to me than they are now. Sulfur will absolutely eat them up. Um, you know, so it's your best friend. So you think like what three times a week? Like I mean, it, it depends. It depends on how big and how bad. But I mean, there's there's a lot more things than just spraying sulfur. I mean, you also we also have to look at the room. When's the last time things have been cleaned? Right. You know, there's so many cracks, crevices, filters, fans that all need to be cleaned. Yeah, spray right? everywhere. But as far as killing them on the plants, sulfur, and then and then probably laying down some Swirsky or I don't know. Swirsky, I think I usually recommend Andersoni, which is, it looks a lot, a lot like Swirsky, but you, it's just. You uh, said Andersoni? Andersoni, yep. Yeah. It's one of the more expensive ones, but if, if I'm dealing russets, um, that's, that's where I start. Awesome. But I mean, Swirsky will eat them, but russets are better, and if you've got an active population, then just start there. Uh, the Andersoni is like you said. Would you reapply every two weeks? Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. You're gonna you're gonna you're gonna want to go on a good you know. There every I, I know a lot of guys have been growing a long time and we've talked sulfur treatments for russets a lot and typically most guys for something like that if they're having a infestation are gonna do either three days in a row or they're gonna do 
one on one off one on one off you know what i mean and then they're going to usually do a wash down of the plants yeah. and then they're going to pry apply something at like 100 mils like athena ipm they're going to because you want to start whipping out all those different tools right. would i use an oil base just on no i wouldn't but i'll knock them hard with sulfur wash them then go to an oil base just to just to hit any residual that might be back with something different right and well, then go to a buck plan and just like you were saying like switching your products most of these products have they're targeting one stage whether it's adult pupa egg um, so alternating your products will help you hit those different stages of growth and if you just use one product you're always usually leaving a stage behind and you know that's why you want to follow up on a five to seven day you know at least to catch those next groups that are starting to hatch or mm -hmm. get into the next stage um, again nothing is a one and done nothing you do in the garden is one and done unless you're using systemic stuff <laughs> yeah. so no. don't yeah you don't ever want to get there you no. know we call, we call it the kill shot it's a sensitive subject in uh in, in cannabis growing um i i do not um like uh pesticides um i'm not i uh i i'm you know i'm not for it i think there are times in the, in the food industry, we've had to use them. I think there's a time and a place to use them uh, in cannabis. If I have a genetic that's swarmed with, with russet mites and that's it, it's all I have is with this plant. I got nothing else. It's something I hunted or whatever. Would I would I hit it with a systemic? Yeah, I would. You know what I mean? I'm not going to lose something. Now, am I going to go take that and just throw it right into flour and then give it to my best friend to smoke? Absolutely <laughs> fucking not. You know what I mean? I'm going to have to clone that plant down and grow it up and clone it down. And I probably go get it tested to make sure there's no residuals left in the plant. And you just so I mean? you guys know what the, like a systemic, the plant is absorbing that chemistry through the root system. The mm -hmm. chemistry is active in the plant tissue. The bug eats the plant tissue. The bug then gets that chemistry and dies. So it's active within. It's hard to say, usually the, the theory is about six to eight weeks is how long it will stay active in the plant tissue. I don't think anyone really knows. Um, so, you know, in the setting where you're, you have to use it, it would be like early veg and then you're done. It's in there, we're hoping it's gonna be long gone, but like, I would never advise it, but just so you guys understand how that works and uh, what it does. Yes, sir. Uh, so, what about for the people that like, I know for like uh, some commercial facilities, training like Theracol, just to stop like the PM. And yeah. Just so that the, it's mainly to pass tests. It's exactly like, microbials. Sure. Yep. Yeah. Right. And I, I, as an I, I was an IPM. Um, well, I don't even know what the word is. I was the, in charge of IPM at a facility, and you know we were fighting microbials. And yes, zero tolerance fog days before harvest. You know it 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 goes away. It doesn't show up on a test. It kills microbials. Do I want to do that? No. But if you're in a legal market and you're fighting aspergillus or you're fighting one of these other microbials that will ruin your whole crop, but doesn't really show up or look like anything on the plant, um, it's a great tool to have in your pocket. And I, I would only do it on an as needed basis, but having experimented with it, you can spray that, or I see guys doing a full plant dump after harvest. They'll take yeah. the thing off, do it in a concentrated five gallon bucket, Jesus hang it up. Christ. I mean, Christ. chemically wise, it's, it's not gonna leave anything behind, do I want to do that ever on a finished flower? No. Um, but when your hands are tied and you've got investors looking at you and you've got, you know, a million dollars sitting in front of you in, in flower, you got to make some calls. And, you know, that's... There's there's a million things that we could we could go down and rattle over yeah, three hours. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Remediation, chlorine dioxide after, you know, in the dryer. You can do a million things to make weed clean yep. um, that are... It's just like, I think we also get into a conversation of... That's why there's so much shitty ass weed on the market. You know what I mean? Yes. And, and like, I've never smoked some fire that my boy dunked in a five gallon bucket. <laughs> I never have, you know. Um, and so, Absolutely. so yeah, there, there's a time and a place for for pesticides. A very, you know, I, I can tell you also from having a lot of friends in illegal, and I know some of my close friends that have that have uh, tested for specifically mycobutanol, which is your active ingredient like Eagle Twenty. It's very, very disgusting. Absolutely horrendous systemic. Um, it's got about a 60 day half life on paper. I have friends that have cloned down now four times in a row with clones they know where they were infected. It's still present wow. eight months later in the same plant. Okay. So there are certain ones that even on paper, if they say it's this half life, yeah. it is a, there are some nasty, there's some nasty oh. stuff out there, you know? Um, yes, in the back. In the horticulture industry, the hardest test to pass is a pesticide applicator's license if you plan to spray food. 
Yeah. Yep. Uh, it is ridiculously hard and vigorous, and nobody I know has ever passed that test. <laughs> Uh, and if you ever want to spray food crops, you will need to pass that test. I mean, I have that. You know, I, I have a pesticide applicator license. You know, whether you're in, if you're going somewhere to do it for somebody else, there's a totally different test than when, if you're doing it in-house. Yep. And it's a much harder test to do it off-site. Off um, but yeah, I mean, also, having... whether you're spraying ornamentals or food is two totally different tests true. as well. True, yep. And I mean... The, you know, I see people, a lot of people over the past 20 years, you know, we've, we've tried Avid. There's a reason that you have to do a pesticide applicator test because the shit is super toxic yeah. and you need to follow a certain set of procedures to use it. And one is using the right gear. Two is making sure people don't go back in the spot and using the right rate, like, you know. So I always get scared when I see people using the products that I can use in ornamentals having been trained but having not having that training, it's there's some scary shit. And like, you don't put the respirator on. You you know, part of the reason I started this company was I was tired of spraying all that shit. And and it was my job. And I'm a young guy. I'm trying to you know I have kids. Like I don't want that in my body. So this has taken that all away from me, and it's a beautiful thing. And um, you know, if you're gonna spray, just follow the go online, look at the label. It'll tell you exactly what to wear, how long you should not be in that room. It's called the re-entry interval or REI. Um, and those are important pieces if you're gonna spray it, just to know. Whatever it is. I mean it's on Azagar, it's on the feet. I don't know if Fina has right. Yeah, they do. Yeah, SOP procedures for all that. Yep. Yeah, you think that's tough. Try your seven day fumigation license in the state of Michigan. Oh, yeah, yeah. About five tests later I finally passed. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, awesome. Well, I would like to get into a few things that I know were brought up. I kind of answered some DMs and went through some frequent stuff that I, I get a lot and I think with the market where it's at and now that we're, we're about year four now with high power LEDs and salt feed being predominant in the industry, um, you know, just some topics I wanted to talk about. Uh, a lot of things I've experienced myself. I think I know others have degradation of quality, but, you know, light levels that are acceptable. Um, I think, I, think uh, I know I myself um, want to talk about quality versus quantity, production versus craft you know, and uh, some of the things that go along with that, which, uh, you know, feeding high ECs, blasting stuff with just insane light levels, and, and you know, and, and I think um, all of us can probably agree that there's a very fine, there's a very fine line where, where like, you're going to start degradating quality by, by having too high of the ECs, um, too high of the light levels, um, you know, and a lot of this, a lot of this is genetic specific. I have some 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 stuff that I've hunted recently that does not like high PPFE, and one of the first signs when you're when you're blasting stuff with too much light is, especially in flower, is the buds just start to blow out. And I think everybody probably knows what that looks like. Um, if you're growing under LEDs, uh, maybe you guys have seen like the one color that stretches a little bit too far and gets closer to the light, and the degradation that can happen at those tops compared to what your mid-level canopy flowers are looking like, right? Um, I played around with, especially with Athena, with just insane ECs, four or five EC, 15, 1600 PPFE at the canopy, and you, you can yield four or five pounds of light with the high power LEDs and salts, but your, your level of quality will be about right there. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, and, and, that, and, that, and that's, just, that's, that's just degradation of quality. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, there, there is, and you know, networking and, and being in a lot of gardens, there seems to be a level you know, finding that medium where we're still getting quality flower, we're not blowing things out of proportion, we're getting tight flowers. You know, I, obviously every genetic's a little bit different. Um, but wanted, wanted to just talk, you guys experienced this in your garden, you know, the result of that. Have, have, you, have you grown enough rounds under like salts and LEDs or whatever you're feeding? Um, and have you, have you ever hit the lights too hard to where you notice a round comes down, and you're like, man, this stuff just isn't, it's not the same as last round. I know I have, you know, for sure. Um, different feeding, I'll see somebody try something, I'm gonna try that, and I'm like, nah, just, that didn't work out for me, you know. Um, you know, for salts, um, you know, with, with Athena specifically, uh, that uh, most salts, every salt out, you know, that I'm aware of, it, it was in, with, is within this range of about 2.5 to 3 EC, within a range. Um, salt feeding is different than organic feeding, completely different, I think most of us know that. Um, you know, even liquid nutrients being completely different from their water-soluble counterparts. Um, I think most of us only had the option of growing liquids for years. If you've been growing for you know 15, 20 years, there was no 
bags of, of salsa use uh, at the grocery store 15 years ago, at least very few. Um, and so feeding liquids is, is much different than feeding, and you, you can make the same mistake with, with liquid feeds as well. A lot of that has to do with, with, with the lighting. Um, you know, LEDs are, are an amazing tool to use. I've definitely abused them. I, I think that um, some, of the, some of the, it's very easy to tell when things are thrown under LEDs, and it's very easy to tell for me, and I'm talking about my own flower. I can look through packs and be like, HPS, <laughs> LED, LED with way too much light, <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and you, could have, you could have the same strains laid out. Um, has, anybody, has anybody transitioned over in the last year or two from you know, growing under HPS for a long period of time and going to LEDs? Um, was there any learning curve for you guys? You experienced any um, trying to run higher light, differences in quality, differences in yield, stuff like that? What's that? Higher Yep. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, and then also getting that uh, dehumidification. Yeah, yeah, dehumidification is a big part. What's that? I said that you need like double the class. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, dehumidification is crazy. Running higher temperatures is important. Um, you know, and, and for me, I've almost gone back to, uh, sounds stupid, but I'm, I'm back to almost running the same TPFD with LEDs as I did with HBS. Uh, I do with HBS. And before it was much higher. And, I, you know, and then a lot of that is information that first came on the market. Oh, I'm supposed to use them this way. Oh, I can, I can hit with more light and just raise my CO2 and find my BPD. And you can yield a lot of weed under LEDs. It's the most, but you know, and you can get very good quality, but there's a threshold. Um, and I don't, I think, it, I don't think there's a set parameter for that. Genetics play a big part in that. Um, but uh, I think that, you know, finding that threshold is also, also going to, help us survive in this market i also think what it it, it, it di differentiates production quality versus more craft quality and there's a lot of other factors that go into that as well um you know in production most production settings they're 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 focused on one thing and that's yield 100 percent. and if that's your lane even in the black market if that's your lane i get it you know what i mean if it's if it's if it's mass produced strains a little bit lower quality but the yield and if you know a, a friend of mine and, and has this thinking and, and i get it it's like one light is worth so much money to him. He needs to get three thousand dollars of light. Doesn't give a fuck which way it comes in. You want to get four pounds of light at eight hundred bucks and get that thirty-two hundred bucks, or you want to get two pounds of light and of good quality and sell it for fifteen hundred. He doesn't give a shit as long as he's getting three grand of light. I, I respect that. You know what I mean? And and uh, there's always going to be, <laughs> and I think in this industry there's always going to be the people that want craft that care about what's going into their lungs and having stuff that's pesticide free. And then there's Unfortunately, there's going to be most of America that just wants to drink Bud Light. You know what I mean? And uh, man, I give a shit, bro. That fifty dollar ounce is hot. <laughs> uh, so um, I, I just want to have a little bit of a conversation with you guys surrounding this. Um, you know, me personally, um, I don't like you know under under LEDs. Uh, I found and I still mess with this um, every round. I'm tweaking things a little bit. But with LEDs, I'm really in that like 900 to 1,000, and I never go over anymore. PPFD. Um, some strains of mine are sub 900. 8 to 900 is still the marker. Uh, HPS, you know, like is still the same as it was for me as it was years ago, and I'm finding that 750 to 900 to be just optimal. Now is this with or without CO2? This is with CO2. Yeah, if you don't have CO2, you're you're going to be significantly lower, uh, especially under LEDs. And, and, and really under CO2, you've got to start watching the plants and how they respond. Oh, yeah. As soon as you see curling and, oh, shit, it's too much, yeah, you got to bring that light intensity down. What's up, Ron? Um, question, when running your rooms hotter because of the radiant heat and LED, what about these surface temperatures? It seems like my, these surface temperatures run a little higher than I like to see it. Now, under LED? What are your ambient temperatures? Uh, you mean what's the room running at? What's their ambient room temperature, yeah. Eight, well, we're running 83, 82, 83. And then what's your, what's your lead service? Uh, 85. Really? It should be seen a little bit lower under LED. Usually it's vice versa. It's a little hotter under HPS. Well, and we got mixed lighting, so we got like four See, and that, HPS and, and six LED. And, and, that's, and that's where, like, and, and I don't think sometimes, I have a lot of friends that are running that legal right now, mixed spectrum. And I think that's the only the only thing that I like. I kind of actually want to mess around with it because I think the only the only problem the issue I have is now we have this mix of where where am I supposed to land? Are your plants happy? At the end of the day, I'm always going on. Are my plants happy? 
Uh, am, I, am I seeing a response out of my want? Then maybe that 85 surface leaf temperature underneath the mixed spectrum is right. I don't know. Well, I know well, under, under HPS, I'm always going to see a little bit hotter. If I'm running, um, if I'm running uh, you know, 80 degrees, I'm going to be right, I'm going to be right around that, either 78 to, to 79 to 80 or 81. Well, what are you running your rooms on the, under LED? Under LED, uh, you know, I'm usually like 81, 82 degrees ambient, uh, week one to two a flower. And then by week three, I'm in, I'm in the eighties. I'll usually hang out there till like week five. And then I start tapering way down. I used to keep it a lot hotter. I feel like you'll get much more yields for sure. Keeping it hotter later in the flower. I've also seen that personally, just, uh, my quality seems to go down. I like tight flowers. I don't want blown out looking flowers. I'm very picky. I'd rather have a little less yield <coughs> and, and, and have my stuff look like it's supposed to. Um, and I feel like Especially under HPS, dude. I like it slow and slow, you know, um, for sure. So, but trying to find, I guess the purpose of bringing this all up too was just in this industry we're in where it's cutthroat and, you know, it, it, like, what what are we doing? What am I doing? What are you doing to, to differentiate yourself, you know? And, and am, I, am I looking at stuff like this? Like my quality, am I, am I saying, okay, I had a good round. My buds got a little too wide, right? Do I need to dial back a little bit on the feed? Do I need to dial a little bit back on the light? You know, because I found personally that finding that, that happy medium for everything and really trying to dial in each genetic is, is, is important too because everything's a little bit different. And sometimes you got to find a happy medium that you may have six strains in your room. They all like it a little bit different, so you got to find a happy medium, you know? So, because I, I, want, I want to have something that stands out. You know, I don't want to just throw it in a room on irrigation under high powered lights, feed it a, you know, and just walk away. Cause I'm going to get a, a, a product that looks like the other 6,000 growers doing the same thing, you know? So what's your uh, DLI? Cause I, 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 I'm just assuming it's 12 hours, right? I, I, dude, I really, I change shit up. I go 10, 14, 11, 13, 12, 12. I'm all over the place during a flower cycle. Yeah. I'll, I'll start at, I'll start at 12, 12. I'll go down to 11, 13. I'll go down to 10, 14 the last two weeks. I'll do, I got a whole crop going on 11, 13 right now. You know what I mean? DLI really, it, 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 it really depends on the, the, you know, the, it really depends on the strains I have in there. You know, I have some that really want a low, I won't go above 35, 40 DLI. I have some plants I'll push as high as 60. I will blast them and they will take it. You know what I mean? Um, stuff that is heavy in sherb, any sherb crosses, typically stuff coming from seed junkie off of sherb can handle a lot of light without getting wonky. You know, um, I have other stuff, white truffle, somebody said it back there. You give that thing too much light, dude, it don't even look like, it, the quality is right out the window. And it looks like trash, you know what I mean? So I think it's like identifying, it could be, I'd say a range of like 35 to 60, you know, depending on what you're, on what you're growing, you know what I mean? And, and kind of the strengths that you have. So obviously lower feeds, lower light are, are gonna equal lower, lower yield, right? Your DLI is the number one factor in your yield. I mean, I will honestly say number one. It's a huge factor in yield. So again, it, you also got to look at what market. What is what are you trying to do, right? Are you just trying to produce weed to sell, and you want a lot of it, and your 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 guy that wants it wants to pay eight hundred bucks? Well, guess what? Five EC, fifteen hundred micromoles, and go get you something high yielding and let that bitch rip. But is it because that's about what eight hundred dollar weed's worth? You know what I mean? Is, is that level of care, in my opinion, right? And if we want to try to if, if we want, if our lane is different and it's more craft, then it's like, okay, what do we have to do to get that genetic expressed in, in the right way? You know, um, how we know we can. I know I've had runs where I've had white truffle come out phenomenal before I really knew much about that strain growing it. And then I pegged it with too much light and I've been like, bro, this, this looks like swag. You know what I mean? It's not even the same flower. And I want the batch that comes out looking the best. So taking notes and trying to really dial in those genetics, it could be 35 DLI. Not only that, but I think flavor and aroma has a lot. Flavor and aroma is a huge part, you know. I mean, flavor, high PPFD, high leaf surface temperature laid in flower, high ambient temperatures laid in flower are going to all decrease, you know, resonant turfs for sure. Yeah, I look at um, it like steroids and bodybuilders, you know what I mean? You look good on the outside, but then your girl ain't going to be too happy at the end of that. <laughs> <laughs> you want to go to the next slide? Yeah. Um... Uh, th this one's more just like, you know, planning ahead as far as yeah. creating the room and dialing it in. Yep, yep. So, so I want to, what I want to talk about here too was, um, wanted to talk about like, you know, make sure, making sure your room is dialed, right? 
um, and, and making sure that your setup is good from day one. So I think we all, I know I have, and I still have one room. Well, I got a truck full of DHUs because I didn't do things right the first time. And now I have to go spend a lot of money taking everything down and redoing it. So setting up your room right the first time, um, whether it's HPS, LED, a little bit difference there, you know, figuring out your pints, going above and beyond on, on humidification, especially if you're an LED, and really you know, making sure your tonnage is right, making sure your airflow is right, your plant spacing, everything, have a plan going into a room and make sure it's dialed, right? Like if I put together a room, I'm typically gonna bring that room up to temperature and I'm gonna try, I'm gonna get everything dialed in before I ever bring plants in. Um, as far as dehumidification goes, I would go, I would go above and, and beyond, you know, um, in figuring out your pints per day. So you always wanna figure out how many gallons a day you're feeding, right? Whatever, at, at max flour. So for me, I'm usually gonna be feeding the most uh, right after I get into swell, um, those plants are, or end of stretch into swell is when I'm feeding the most. And, and, and if you guys ever noticed, I actually got a call from my buddy last night. He goes, Dude, I'm having little spikes at night when my lights go off. I'm like, what day are you at? He's like, I'm, you know, we're day 17. So he's, he's just, he's about ready to strip. The foliage is as full as it's going to be in that room. Mm -hmm. So at that, at that point is when I would expect to see a spike at night when lights go off. If there's going to be a time it's going to be right before strip when your plants are the most full of foliage. They haven't been skirted down yet. They haven't been touched. Um, I would expect to see that. And, and that's really the point at which I need to be able to handle as far as dehumidification goes. So I'm going to go off that point in watering. If I'm feeding 300 gallons a day, you know, and I'm at eight pints a gallon, and that's, what is that, 2,400 pints? You know, I'm going to go 3,000 pints on my dehumidification. I'm going to go way over. I'm not going to go with 2,400. I'm going to go with 3,000. About what, like 25% or something like that? I mean, really, yeah, but it comes down to, I'll just throw, if I got a room of Quest 335s, I'm putting an extra one in there. Right, right. I'm like, man, I'm right on the verge, another unit. Yeah. You know, yeah, 20 to 25% above is what I want to be, or more if it, yeah. it means I got to put one more unit in, it's just a whole other unit. Because right, right. I don't want to struggle later, and when I get later in flower, you know, in the last the last couple of weeks, I want to be able to, I want to be able to take my room anywhere I want. I want to be in the low 40s for dehumidification the last couple of weeks, especially at night. I don't want to see swings. Um, you know, one of the things that was brought up was powder mildew earlier, and I think that's, we brought this up in every class we've done. It's probably something that plugs, it's, it's very easy to get, and once you get it, it's very hard to get rid of. Um, you'll, you'll catch your tail with it 99% of the time. It's, it's, it's environmental. Um, it obviously is, can come in on genetics. These, like, uh, seasonal changes right now, really yep. big times. Yep. You know what I mean? Because you can be, your room can be adjusted to its cold and dry outside, and then boom, it's... Yep. 70 and humid the next day. Yep. You know what I mean? When planning your room, you want to account for that. Yep. You know, and okay, I'm accounting for what it is today, but am I accounting for what it's going to be in the middle of summer or in the middle of winter? Mm -hmm. And how does that play and all that shit? So I have one room that I've ever set up right the first time. <laughs> Every other one I've had to go back and make changes. You know it costs what I mean? More money. And and it does. It costs more time and downtime. So I'm down for 30 days right now because I got contractors coming in, I got a fucking bunch of work to do and you know, and, and uh, you know, and then and then obviously once we set up that room, you know, um, we, we want to maintenance and take care of all of our equipment. That's another that's another big thing. Um, you know, as as far as just relates to pests as well, guys, filters are the number one thing. I see people just your filters should be changed every run. Your filters should be changed every single run, and your dehues and your uh, air air units. Um, I run HEPA filters in all my rooms. You know, I'll use, at least blow those out every other run, clean them out. You should always be inspecting your filters for any si any kind of pest activity, flyers specifically. Um, like I said earlier, anything that's airborne is going to get sucked into those filters, okay? Yes, moles and, moles and mildew particles are part of that, but also pests are another part of that. Um, and typically, I'm going to be seeing either flying fly gnats, maybe a random house fly or fruit fly, and, and worst case scenario, I'll see like a flying, a flying aphid, right? And identifying those and putting them on a scope. Um, and and uh, resetting that room properly in, in between every single time. Why don't you get into your reset protocol? Yeah, I, I, what options are? I think that was that blank slide that I. Yeah, I think um, I think when we get into reset procedures, I, I I I have definitely rushed that a lot in the past myself. I mean, who here has been the victim of my clothes are already too big? Fuck it, we gotta go. Right. <laughs> right. Uh, ain't that big of a deal. I'll get that next time. It's only then fucking this. It's the nature of what, you know, especially in, it happens in the legal, um, happens probably more in 
most guys that run around the black market, you got all these different spots, you run around like a maniac. I mean, and, and uh, you know, it's, it's, it's like you, you schedule this day and it has to happen and, and uh, sometimes things aren't ready. And so when I'm going through a reset process, obviously the room's coming down. And then the first thing I'm gonna do, which probably everybody does, is I'm gonna do a dry clean of the room. That's where I'm gonna take up all the particulates. I'm gonna get vacuums out. We're gonna make sure the filters on those vacuums are clean, okay? Those should be, those should be changed out. Uh, frequently, um, vacuums should always be cleaned as well. And one of the, when I go to a facility and, and I have a nature of, of doing audits for the federal government for food for a long time, and one of the first things I would always look at in food industries, and I do the same thing with grow, is I'm gonna go right to your vacuum and look at it. You're looking in your back room, vacuum is gonna tell me what I'm gonna see when I walk into your rooms. I promise you. If you're not taking care of your, the little things like that, that 99% of the time when you walk into a room, and, and this is this was me for years. I clean everything but my fan. You used to walk in next to my fans and just be plastered with bugs. The tables were clean, but the you know, all, all the little things, right? The detail stuff. Um, vacuums are huge drains are another thing that I just I used to overlook. I've overlooked for years. So we're always gonna start with a dry clean. We're gonna make sure the equipment we're bringing in to clean is always clean first. Um, we're gonna get a good dry clean done. Um, and then once a the dry clean is done, we're gonna move into doing a wet clean. Um, wet clean is gonna involve resetting your room properly uh, from the ground up, or I'm sorry, from the top down. Um, and you know, I, I like to use, you need to be using cleaning products. Um, there's tons of products out there. BioSafe makes a bunch of products. Athena has a whole clean line dedicated to, to resetting your room. Um, you know, you should be cleaning, uh, sanitize, using a sanitizer. A common mistake I see is I see people use like a Sanidate product um, and they're not, they're not, or they're, they're using like a, a sanitizing agent. Um, sanitizing something is not cleaning. So, you know, you need to, you know, remove the buildup first and then sanitize when you're done. So typically I'm always, when I wet clean, we're going to wet the tables down. We're still scrubbing. I foam my rooms, but that foaming is what I do at the very end. So I'm going to wipe down everything first. Um, if I have build up fans, all that stuff's kind of getting wiped down. And then the last step that we're going to do is we're going to, so we're going to clean and then we're going to sanitize. And this is the entire room and everything in it. You know, what's um, the product from, um, Athena for the clean portion or is it? Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, it's, uh, you're going to use, uh, you know, you want a foaming agent, yeah. right? Because killing mildews and microbials, especially it's all about contact time. Okay. It's about contact time. If you spray something with bleach and then wipe it right off, we didn't do anything. We need contact time, right? We got it. We got contact. We got to let it sit. That's why a lot of the cleaning agents over the years always involve a foaming agent. It's because we want that foam to stick. Now the foam consistency that we need to stick to a wall is different than we do a flat surface like a table. Um, so using like the Athena reset foamer, which is really nice because it's just got a dial in the back. You don't got to mess with anything and just crank it up. It gets thicker, turn it down, it gets thinner. I'm going to hit my walls with a really thick foam so it has contact time. And that uses parafoam and then a reset. Um, and, and that's just a blend of oxidizers, chelates. Uh, everything you need to disinfect and sanitize hard surfaces. Uh, most cleaning agents are like that. We just want to make sure that we differentiate cleaning from sanitizing, right? Cleaning is manually cleaning, scrubbing. We're getting the buildup off the of tables. When I'm all done, I'm going to come through and I'm going to, I'm going to spray something that's going to have contact time to sanitize and kill um, mildews and molds that are left over in the room. Um, and then wiping down fans, lights, you know, all stuff like that. Do I wipe down my lights every single run? Do I get up on a ladder? No, but every couple runs I am up there looking at like, what kind of dust do I got on top of my filters? I'm gonna wipe everything down. Um, anything with filters that we talked about should be replaced. And that's usually the, the, the thing I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna get into filters, you know, dehues, HVAC, um, Anything like that needs to be cleaned. Uh, filters should be changed out. Uh, if you're using the most disgusting thing in the world, which is those things right there. Yeah. Anybody who's been in these classes knows how much I hate those things. Uh, they're just a, and I, I use them, so I'm not knocking them. I use them, but they are a, they are just a cesspool for disgustingness inside of that, that, that unit right there. So making sure that you're spending time cleaning those. Uh, power, a low PSI power washer works great on them. Um, I, I have a really nice Ryobi. You can get it from Home Depot. They come with like a table cleaning attachment for like surfaces. They work awesome. 
Um, I use that on those, um, and then hitting it with that same cleaning product, cleaning and sanitizing routine on those wheels, making sure those, those are nice and clean. Um, so we're gonna go through that process. And then at the end, there's a lot of extras that you can do. Uh, what I personally do, once we've gone through this cleaning process and I have a pretty clean room, when I get to the end, I'm gonna reset, do the final stage of reset, which I'm gonna clean. I, I, I bomb the room for uh, air quality. I want good air quality. I wanna kill everything that's in the room. I'm gonna use some sort of chlorine dioxide product. Um, they make a few of them out there. I like Garden Clean. I know the guys over there, Procure's another one. Um, I'm, I'm sure they sell one of them, one or the other here. Um, I like chlorine dioxide. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna gas the room with that at the very end. When I gas a room with something like chlorine dioxide, okay, I want all of my HVAC equipment and anything that's, that's in that room, that's, I want it to be on and running. So it can pull that through the system. So it can pull it through that thing right there, right? And, what, what, and, and you're typically gonna do that at the very end of the day. You're gonna set off that chlorine dioxide, close the room, really you only need four to six hours. I typically let it go overnight. Now when you're calculating for these products out there, make sure you're doing your calculations off a of cubic foot. Um, I've made the mistake in the past of doing square feet. They are all designed to be measured off of cubic feet of the room. So do your cubic feet measurements, get the packs that are appropriate, release that gas overnight. How this relates to pests. This is the time if you've been battling something like the, the, the guy with the, or we talked about the root aphids, or if, you, if you're dealing with something in flower, make sure you're being very diligent on this reset process. And you can also throw in some kind of like bomb yes. for bugs, like yep. a pyrethrin bomb. Pyrethrin, that's what I was gonna say. The last step here is if I'm dealing with, if I've been diligent this whole process, I cleaned all my tables. So tables, um, excuse me, drains and filters in your room are gonna be the biggest, biggest places that you wanna make sure that people will forget when, when they dealt with a pest. They clean the room good, they wipe down the walls, they don't change filters, and they don't hit the drain. Those are the two areas you wanna make sure you hit. If you've hit all that, you've been dealing with infestation, I would definitely hit it with some sort of bomb at the end. Uh, pyrethrin is a, is a great option. Uh, you know, clear the room out. Um, make sure, obviously, that your, if your, your room should be sealed. And what that means is that nothing can, can get out. Um, if you have panda plastic partition walls in between your grow rooms and you've got a room right next door that's week nine of flower, or week eight of flower, I don't think I'd be lighting off pyrethrin bomb that they creep in over into the next, next room. So make sure that your infrastructure is sealed. Um, you know, if you're gonna be doing even stuff like chlorine dioxide. If you're, if, you're, if you're wanting to do this stuff, please make sure your room is sealed. Um, if, you're, if, you're de if your room is in your house, okay, let's talk about that. I mean, if your room is in your house, uh, be very careful and, and don't be in the house. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because that, that's probably not sealed that well, even if it is, especially if you have children and animals, get out of the house. Mm -hmm. For sure. You know, so, um, <laughs> but that's a pretty solid reset procedure. Is um, garden clean? Do you, can you be in the room while it's going on? Or is that you, something that you want it, to it, It's chlorine dioxide. It, it works. It, it t it's not like all of a sudden, you can't even see the gas. Yeah. It's not like it starts gassing yeah. off, like yeah. a pyrethrin bomb when you yep. hit it and it, it starts fogging. You can set that up, take your five minutes and get out of the room. It okay. takes a minute to acclimate and to suck up the water and start yep. gassing off. Um, you can go in and out of the room quickly if the light was on or whatever. You just don't want to hang out in there. Okay. So, And then obviously, guys, when you're using any of these products, I don't have the cleaning products here, but any of those cleaning products, they are very caustic. Please wear PPE. I, I mean, I don't know how many times I've gotten that the foaming agents all the all the all the cleaning agents um they're very very caustic they will burn you uh wear goggles wear safety wear wear good PPE respect that, that stuff, stuff man yeah, yeah. yeah. sanity i mean all that stuff is gonna so last last your thing, lungs and last thing last we touched on everything inside the room the only other thing we got to touch on is if you have irrigation um and honestly if, even if you're hand watering uh, a lot of the same method can be applied if you have a res tank, which sure everybody does, um, even if they're hand watering, making sure that we're cleaning out our hoses. You know, even if you're hand watering with a wand, the same products that we're gonna use to pump through our irrigation lines, I pump through every one of my rooms, I have a spigot with a hand with a wand. Because at some point I'll have to hand water something. Whether it's a plant not drying back the same, so I'm gonna let that one sit and then have to hit it later, or whatever. I always have a hose in my room. So when I pump my irrigation system, those hoses are included with that all the way to making sure it's running out the end and letting it sit overnight, right? So if we have an irrigation system or a hand water system, we're gonna to wanna to use 
I like using the Renew from Athena because it, I don't have to read 9,000 directions on what to apply. It's easy, it's one ounce a gallon. Um, I'm gonna pump that through my system um, and I'm gonna let it set for 12 hours overnight typically. If when you apply it through your system, you wanna let it open every hose, open, you know, let it come out of every dripper, anywhere where the irrigation can, can, can let out any spigot, let it run all the way through till you can smell it coming out, close everything up, give it 12 hours and then, and then pump everything through. Um, if, if you are smelling things you don't want to smell or you open a valve and you're still seeing build up, give it a second application. But if you're running clean and sterile, uh, even if you're not, if you don't deal with a lot of organics in your lines, uh, one treatment at one ounce a gallon should be, should be more than enough. Now that why we let it set overnight is to break down biofilm and also again, contact time. We need to sterilize inside the lines and keep biofilms and bacteria and stuff from, from starting to grow. And that's, that's the kill step for the irrigation. Um, and then, and then we're going to, we're going to verify that, the, that the room is clean. We're going to go through and double check everything before we bring, we bring plants back in. And this whole reset process should happen, whether we're having infestations or not. But if you have a pest issue in your rooms, be very, very dim. I don't really change much up if I'm dealing with pest pressure, like for my room, I got thrips in right now. I don't have some like secret thing I do, but I will. I got a, pyre a couple pyrethrin bombs. I'll, just just because I, it, all it takes is all it takes is something to not be cleaned up. And that life cycle is going to start again. You know what I mean? Could be a filter I don't clean. <coughs> you know, and, and I got some stuff that's stuck up there that's not completely dead, and that life cycle is going to start all over again. So if you're changing filters, do you want to keep the filters in while you do those bombs, or take them out? I take so so if I'm if I'm doing if I'm doing the bug bomb because it is a fog, um, I'll wait. I'll, I'll kind of redo this, so I'll, I'll put my, my clean filters back in, right? After, after I let that pyrethrin, if it's chlorine dioxide, and that's all you're using, you can put the new filters in, start everything up and let it run. Yep. All that's gonna help you sterilize anything. It just, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sterilizer. And just so, so you guys know, like pyrethrum is a, it's a great contact killer. It'll kill almost any bug that you put it on and it doesn't last very long. It's got a really short half-life. So it's a great tool to have in your tool belt to get some really quick contact kill. It's better than any of the products that I have in front of me here. Um, so keep that in mind. I, I, you know, It's not in the legal market, you can't use it, but it's a great tool and it shouldn't scare you as much as some of the other stuff. And um, so just keep that in mind. But like with the bomb, you're really only gonna be dealing with active bugs. So even that you know, is part of the process, but would not take care of any eggs. So just wanna point that out. Yep. Yep. That's where, that's where, that's where cleaning, physically cleaning mm -hmm. and hitting all those hard spots is, is going to help within your, in your reset procedure. I, I, if, if you're dealing with something like this, especially just be diligent on that room reset, because if you miss one thing, that problem's going to follow you. Those things are, they are very hard to get rid of hundred percent or without calling in the, the pesticide army. They are, they are, you gotta be on it and you gotta just follow these processes very, very thoroughly and, and you know, use your eyes, make sure that everything's cleaned up. Sometimes, honestly, by a few times I've had those things, I'll let that room set for like a week, clean. And I'll just keep going back in there seeing if I see anything, like crawling back around. I, mean, I get very OCD with stuff like that. Um, so just use your eyes and your ears and verify that, that all this stuff is clean. Um, and then, and then obviously your common ways, your hallways, your stairways, if you're in a basement, all the surrounding areas, all that should be cleaned with the same level of care. You know, if, if, if you know, my grows are not just clean in the room, they're clean everywhere. You know, the outside grounds are clean. I don't have trash barrels sitting right outside the door full of water with filters and old drippers and just shit laying around. I mean, mm -hmm. just taking care and keeping things clean is, is, is a way that you eliminate pests and also harborage, right? Like. For instance, if you've got a barn you're growing in and you don't keep the perimeter clean, your perimeter should be clean because mice and, and everything else, they want to harbor. And so keeping all that away from your buildings, keeping things clean, and, and really that old saying that cleanliness is next to godliness. It's, I've never been in a, in a, in a grow that's filthy, that's disgusting and they grow fire. And they're, they're just like their bags are killing it. I've never seen that. You know what I mean? And, it, and it's, it's not because they're... It's, it's because it just kind of goes hand in hand, you know, um, if you're being clean, doesn't mean you're going to just have a great round every time, but you, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's, it's it sets the, it sets the groove. A lot of facilities I go to, and I'm sure he can speak the same. 
I, I walk right into the vestibule area and nine times out of 10, if I'm meeting a happy staff and they're smiling and the place is clean, I, I, I promise you when I go in there, they're, they're doing well. If I walk in and they're sweating and the employees are running around and it's frantic and there's dirt in the corners and their, their entry mat hasn't been changed in three weeks, I'm like, bro, where's Cintas been at? I already know what I'm walking into, you know? And it, it kind of sets the stage for, for everything. So, but it, it's this, this, guys, this is, this whole stuff is sound. We can sit here and talk about it, but to, when we're outside of here in our daily grind, in our routine with all the stuff that growing can throw at us, it's very hard. And I will tell you from my own experience, it's very hard to stay diligent to all this, mm -hmm. like a machine. It's very hard. And I learned through pain and stress. Shit, I let up again. Shit, I let up again. That's how I learned. That's how I learned. Um, and obviously the more you scale, whether that may mean going from four lights to eight for you, it may mean going from 20 to 100, I don't know, but scaling comes along with, you better be on this even more. Mm -hmm. When you start to scale up, that's when these habits become even more just super critical. So, beautiful. Um, dehumidification, I mean, we kind of covered this, somebody asked about this earlier, I mean, the only, I mean, filters are your biggest thing. You know, the, now you do have a condenser in there. It should stay clean if your filters are clean. Um, I don't know, is Jay still here? Uh, here. He, I, a friend of mine has probably the worst sulfur water I've ever seen. Sulfur will destroy condensers. Uh, a buddy of mine has terrible sulfur in his water to the point where every couple years he has to replace every dehu. It just eats out everything. Eats out all the metal. Destroys the condensers. You know, um, Sulfur is a big killer of that. So let's, let's talk about one thing before we get done. Foliar spraying. I know I've talked on this before, but you want to you prolong the life of that thing? Make sure you shut those off when you're folding your spring. Because all you do not want to suck in, well, for one, if you put a brand new filter in at this reset, so here's the perfect scenario, and I've done this. Filters aren't cheap, especially when you got to replace six of them in a room if you got 60 hues. I go through this whole process, I replace filters, and then two days later I bring plants in, I foliar spray them with a thin IPM, oil born all over the place, sucking them right into all my filters, because what happens when you spray, humidity goes up, right? So all your dehues kick on, suck all that oil still right into your filters and pretty much gotta go change them again. They ain't no good. You know, so always make sure when you're foliar spraying, dehues, and if you have sulfur in your water and you're foliar spraying, you got sulfur in there or you're spraying sulfur. You know how many times I've ruined stuff, you spray sulfur and then you leave all those dehues on, it's just sucking it in. It's not good for not good for it. Not good for your HVAC units. So make sure I shut everything off when I foliar spray. Let it rise up in the room for 20 minutes. Let everything dissipate and then we'll turn everything back on and let it bring it down with all that airborne stuff in the air to get sucked into all your filters. That's, it. That's a, something I've learned over the years is through making mistakes. So full your spray, shut everything off, your, your, um, your mini splits, your air handlers, your dehues, anything running. I shut off all my fans. I shut off everything in the room. It's completely stale, full your spray. I'll usually go drink me a cup of coffee, come back, Turn everything right back on. You know that that ten minutes at a higher VPD or whatever ain't gonna ain't gonna cause no damage. So, <clears throat> anybody else have any cultivation questions? Anything else you want to touch on? Anything else that's like you guys are dealing with, struggling with? Before we go smoke. What's up? Just quick opinion on a couple <laughs> applications for in relation to room reset. Uh, heat. Your opinion on heat treating rooms and then people utilizing ozone generation. So ozone's awesome. I have an ozone generator. Um, I will I will use that um, from time to time as well. Um, great great thing to use on the reset. Again, just I, I will stick it in there. Let everything run. Usually, a lot of times when I use that ozone generator, I'll throw it at the same time. I throw that pack in there and I'll just kind of double hit everything. Heat treating a room. If your if your infrastructure can handle it, do it. Just be just be careful. Your infrastructure can handle it. Yeah. I personally am in pole barn buildings that are retrofitted and you got to get above 140 degrees to really start doing some, some kill effect. You what did you say about 140? I think, yeah, I think 100. I remember Ivan told me why. I think it was 140 or Roach and I have a kid. You can hurt some of the stuff in your room. You've got to yeah. be careful. Yeah. Right. I've, I've seen people just nuke some stuff. And yep. Plastics all melted, tables are all screwed up. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. That's a tough yeah. lesson. Yeah. yeah, I mean, if you're in an HPS room, you can do it easy. It would turn the dehues and the lights on, shut the ACs off. Just make sure your infrastructure can handle it. You know, so. It definitely works though. Flamethrowers work too. Yeah. Because I've wanted to do that a few times. I'll tell you what. 
Kosher? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't really tell you guys like specific protocols for specific pests, but if you guys have, if you want that, I'm happy to like, you know, if I have thrips, do X, Y, Z. You know, I can tell you guys that right now. Um, and with the products I have, and uh, if you want real quick, I can like, you know, we talked about uh, spider mites. Really, the only way I go is persimilis. If I've got them in the room, get persimilis. If I'm fighting thrips and it's mild, I'm really going to start with Swirsky and the Stradio Laylaps, and that's if I have a very mild case. If I start seeing some adults, I will grab some Aureus and throw those in the mix too. So it would be Swirsky, uh, Stradio Laylaps, and Aureus. How long do those bugs last? The Aureus is going to have the longer lifespan, so I think four to six weeks. So for like a big outdoor, would you recommend them? Oh yeah, and I put them in early. Like for me right now, I've been I've been dosing Aureus for the past couple of weeks, just getting them prepped. Um, yeah, start them early. Really think of it like inoculating your room. So like you take this little bottle of a thousand and put it in a thousand square feet and they would be in there working and do that every couple weeks. Um, aphids. Aphids are a bit more of a bitch to deal with and you usually want to have two or three different tools in your belt. I use these cool parasitic wasps that look like a fungus gnat in size and they will fly around the room, they'll look for an aphid and they will lay the eggs in that living aphid and the, the eggs will hatch, the babies will grow and eat the aphid from the inside out. And, and you're left with this. <laughs> yeah, you're left with this just shell of an aphid with a hole in the butt where the wasp climbed out. Yeah. So they're a great scout. They're great for a big space where you can put them in a few corners and they'll find the aphids for you. Um, it's not an eradication though. It's gonna be like you're cohabitating with the aphids and they're dying as they're living and so that's one part. I use Aureus too as another tool. Aureus just go around and kill things. They don't really care. They're just like savage. Um, they'll, they'll do thrips, aphids, whatever. That thing's bite. Yep. And then Watch I'll do, I'll bite do you. lace wings too. <laughs> lace wings I'll get as eggs. I brought you guys, I brought some larva here. There, That's like what they're going to hatch into. But, um, but I'll put eggs around the whole greenhouse and let them hatch. And they'll start doing their job. They'll get to full adulthood. They can fly around lay more eggs. Um, so aphids are definitely the one I, I fight the, the worst. Root aphids. So Delosia, the rogue beetle, Stradio laylaps, the soil mite, going super heavy, like the highest possible rate. You know, don't be afraid. Doing it super early is the most important part. Um, I'll also throw in some nematodes too with the Bavaria as a way to kind of knock back the root aphids as well. I didn't touch on this, I don't think, but these are the, did I talk about? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. all right, cool, the capsules. So new product, easy to use. This is a, instead of doing the drench, you're gonna apply these as a top dress on your soil or your media. I don't do these in rock wool, they don't work good in rock wool, but cocoa and soil, um, about 20 to 25 capsules per gallon of growing media is the rate you're gonna wanna use. And they last for about three to four weeks. So this would be part of a fungus gnat control if you don't feel like mixing your nematodes and doing the drench, this is a way to avoid that. And I generally recommend it after a transplant. So do it like right after your first transplant from veg into your final size pot um, and do it right then. And that's usually all you have to do. And if you guys are seeing, like I see this a lot, this is probably one of the common things. I was just at a facility in Jackson last week and he, this, this individual keeps having problems specifically with fungus gnats and they, and they doesn't have the problem in his bedroom. And we get into flower, he resets the room, he has a diligent process for whatever reason, and, but they also go from one gallon, so they bring him into the room and then they transplant, right? And then he's waiting until stripped to start laying bugs. And if you guys are know that like, okay, I see fungus gnats a lot and I don't want them. If you're going into your flower room, lay day one. Mm -hmm. Like let's prevent, let's prevent mm -hmm. with stradial lapis, hypolob, whatever it is, you know, doing nematode drenches. If you're transplanting when you're going in especially, laying getting that groundwork laid day one right so we have bodyguards out there so that swarm can't start to build up because and that and that's what he's done now right we just he just did a room where he transplanted he he treated day one instead of waiting and now we're at day 10 he's seen he, you know we're, we're we're not seeing much activity right and so it's it's about preventing and staying ahead of the curve uh we we talked a lot today about prevention and it's it, i can't stress that enough especially when it comes to you know, your garden. I have another friend of mine that's just got, two of my friends just got done battling over us. It's on the East Coast. And I'm talking through and I, and I, I just feel, because I've been there, and they're like, dude, they're calling me and they're like, 
get mad at me. They're mad at the wall. They're fucking mad at everybody. You know what I mean? And like the stress that that can bring on you, I just, I'm like, man, I know where you're at. You know what I mean? And, and trying to prevent that is what I'm all about. I, I just don't, I don't like the stress. Yeah. The stress that comes along with like knowing that like, I, feel it over the I just got this yeah. issue. I don't want to leave my house. I'm, I'm like I'm an asshole to everybody. I'm like, what's your problem? I got fucking root aid. He's like, <laughs> <laughs> You know, so oh, all about prevention. And, and like Nick said, if you guys need help identifying like what you should be doing, whatever your scale is, whatever you're seeing, whatever pressures you're seeing, like that's that's what I'm here for. That's what he's here for. Because um, if you set a good prevention plan, I promise you, you won't you won't deal with those fuck moments very often anymore. Where you're like, dude, I'm just I'm at a loss yeah. here and things are out of control. Yeah, yeah, I quit. Where's the flamethrower? Yeah. Mm. So. Yes, sir. What about ladybugs? Yeah, Do you use those I don't personally. That, yeah, that's a good question. And like, I think they're the most common like store. Yeah, right? yeah. Like, I mean, yeah. they can hold longer in the fridge, but they're number one is you can't harvest them economically. Like it's a it's a bad thing for the environment the way they do it to get ladybugs for whatever reason. Like they can't like my bugs are grown in a lab and ladybugs are wild harvested. And that's the number one reason why my company doesn't deal with them. And we've also realized that there's a lot better predators for what we're fighting and that will stick around and won't leave as big of a mess and won't stink and like, sure, so really, yeah, really it, it's not like they don't work and it's not that I don't like them and I use them, I'll use them occasionally in my greenhouse but I think there's better, cleaner tools uh, that are more specialized than ladybugs and you know, if you've got access to them, cool but I think there's better tools that you can, you can use from us at least. And like, you know, ladybugs are a generalist, so they would fall into the same category to me as like an aureus or a lacewing, where they're just gonna eat what's around, whether it's a aphid or a mite or a thrip. Um, so I prefer to use like, like I said, aureus or lacewings in place of ladybugs. So anybody else here, since we're all, well, most of us probably from Michigan, Ohio, the most annoying thing I deal with, which is, it's just an annoyance at this point, is freaking stink bugs. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yep. I don't so annoying. They don't bother or anything. They're just around. Yeah, they're just you don't talk about stink. It's annoying. Just like, yep. <laughs> oh my God. And, and, and man, they're they're hard to just to get rid of. And they'll, they'll, as long as it's decently warm, you get them inside, and then things are. Yeah. Be thankful you don't have to deal with palmetto bugs, though. Yeah, that's yeah. true. <laughs> Blast. Big ass roaches. Yikes. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's pretty good. Too. No, your, your area, it's a, that's a, the good thing you brought that up because wherever you're at, like, I got a lot of friends in, in well, we, we all probably got friends all over the day. I got a lot of friends in Cali and out west that grow and, like, you want to talk about, like, pests with, like, you know, that, have, that have got a, a dude, they have, they've got, like, super thrips yeah. out there yeah, that, like, right. you can spray gas on them and yeah. light them on fire. <laughs> <laughs> they, just, uh, they, 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 like, they, they've definitely got, I hear stories all the time about, like, they had a russet thing out there where it's like, bro, they were spraying, they were like doing whole plant dumps where they had nothing was working on them. And because they, they will build up. Yeah, you know, it's a thing, resistance. Super, you always want to like resistance. rotate your products no matter what you're doing. And like in my industry, you never spray the, the same thing twice because you don't want to build resistance. And the beauty of the bugs is they take that all out of the equation. You yeah, can't you build resi resi yeah. resistance to a predator. Yeah. So uh, it's a great point. And you know, I, it hasn't entered the, the talk in cannabis a whole lot but it is a it's a very common theme in ornamentals is to be very aware of that yeah <clears throat> awesome well, i appreciate you guys all coming out today it's always a blast yeah. hang out for a while we both will if you guys want to talk prevention you want to talk stuff specifically to your garden we'll be hanging out for sure yeah appreciate all you guys coming yeah, out we'll coming, guys. what's up man how, you doing? Good. how are you did you get a Get a, maybe they got a bag. What's up, big dog?